Well, sabah al-khair. Ahla wa sahla. Good morning and welcome to uh, the University of Texas at Austin. My name is Sofian Marabat, and I teach in the Department of Anthropology here. As the organizer of In and Out of Syria conference on the war and the refugee crisis, I would like to first thank a number of individuals and range of academic units across this campus which have made this event possible in the first place. Shortly after my brief introduction, uh, Randy Deal, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, will extend his welcome to you, as will Karen Wilkins, the director of UT Center for Middle Eastern Studies. I will then finish up this first half hour, and we are a little bit late already, by giving some introductory remarks to the conference. The idea of organizing a conference on what is currently unfolding in and around Syria found first resonance within the Center of Middle Eastern Studies and its director. However, I would have been unable to organize anything without the financial support of uh, the following academic units acro across campus, namely the College of Liberal Arts Dean's Office, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, evidently, the Center for European Studies, the South Asia Institute, the Department of Anthropology, the Law School's Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice, the Humanities Institute, the Center for Women's and Gender Studies, the Department of History, the Department of Sociology, the Department of French and Italian, the Department of Germanic Studies, the Program in International Relations and Global Studies, and the Department of Geography and the Environment. A large number of individuals has been instrumental in helping me put this together. While I unfortunately cannot express my gratitude to everybody right now due to obviously the lack of time, I would like to thank my colleague Adriana Dingman from the Anthropology Office for her tireless work in keeping numbers straight and making sure that all invited guests were taken care of appropriately. The chairman of my own department, Tony Di Fiore, has been supportive in hosting this conference from the very beginning, and for that I thank him very much. As well as my colleagues, Douglas Bio from European Studies, Kamran Ali from the South Asia Institute, and Sue Heinzelman from the Center for Women's and Gender Studies. And I need to mention here that it is the center's Nancy Ebert who, upon receiving four photographs of mine, designed on the spot the conference poster and the program, and thank you for doing that. As some uh, of you may have noticed, with the exception of one, all departments, centers, institutes, and programs listed as co-sponsors co are formally part of UT's College of Liberal Arts. They are the ones that, in spite of all budgetary constraints, were not only enthusiastic about the idea of hosting this conference in their midst, they also contributed financially with whatever means they had. And it is therefore my honor to ask Randy Deal, the dean of what we call here COLA, to give his welcoming remarks. Thank you, Sofian. Is this, uh, is this on? Yeah. OK. Um, I want to uh, uh, commend and congratulate Sofian for, for being the, taking the lead in organizing this important conference. Uh, I also want to uh, uh, congratulate him for having been promoted to associate professor this very week. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, welcome to all of you. We have uh, folks here, obviously, from the UT campus, from around the US, uh, and uh, international scholars as well. Uh, this, uh, this topic, uh, uh, the war in Syria, the uh, ensuing refugee uh, crisis, uh, is uh, perhaps the most urgent, most important international topic we're dealing with. Uh, today, and my understanding is this is probably the first conference uh, 
that has been organized to address these specific uh, issues. With that particular focus. With that particular focus. Uh, and as, as Sofian said, it's a liberal arts focus. You know, at a time when I find myself having to uh, defend and justify uh, what we do in the College of Liberal Arts, um, by you know people who who think that you know they where you you uh, if you want to get a job you have to go into business or engineering, uh, I would point to these sets of topics uh, with a, a very strong focus on the social sciences and the humanities to underscore the importance the critical uh, importance of the liberal arts uh, in this day and age. Um, Savian so mentioned a large group of uh, sponsors and co-sponsors. In fact, uh, that's one of the largest groups uh, that I recall uh, uh, in, in uh, many um, uh, instances of introducing uh, conferences. Uh, we may have three and four co-sponsors, but you have almost everybody in the College of Liberal Arts. Um, and that underscores the importance, uh, the critical importance of this topic. Uh, so, um, you know, as a, as a dean, I, I'm invited to, uh, to welcome, uh, to kind of kick off the conference. I rarely am able to stay, and I really regret that in this, in this instance. This promises to be an extremely stimulating discussion. Uh, on that note, again, I welcome all of you. Thank you. Karen, please. Let me introduce to you Karen Wilkins, the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Thank you. I am really pleased to add my warm welcome to you, particularly those of you who are not here in Austin regularly. We're very glad that you're here. I want to point out that not only is this a very significant topic and that attracted a lot of different groups collaborating across the university, but it's really a testament to Sofian's brilliance and networking skills that had so many groups willing to come together and be part of this today. We all understand the significance of the issues and coming from a, a communication and development perspective, the humanitarian issues are incredibly significant. I write about the politics of statistics, so I always hesitate to use them. Um, but we have 13, more than 13 and a half million people requiring humanitarian assistance, 4.6 million refugees, mostly in the Middle Eastern region. We should be taking more in the United States. There's a problem here in understanding and sympathy. 6.6 .6 million displaced within Syria. And when the BBC, as of yesterday, says things like, world powers have agreed to a tentative deal to try to bring about a cessation of hostilities and allow more access for humanitarian aid, for a communications scholar, this brings to mind all that we're missing. We're missing context. We all need much more context about what's happening in the region, and not just since 2011, but prior to that, the role of the United States, Russia, Turkey. These are all very important, and one of the missions for the Center for Middle Eastern Studies is to do what we can to try to add that context so we can educate people who can then potentially make more informed decisions, be more actively engaged. And this is the contribution of the Academy. We have an obligation to share resources, to offer this context through events like these, listening and engaging. This is where understanding the humanity and the significance of the issues that you're talking about today we cannot be silent, and working to make that change is something beginning with events like these and then taking these kinds of events and building on these. And for that, I want to thank you for being willing to take the time to be here, all of you, and for taking the time to share your expertise and to engage in this. Thanks for your time. Well, as mentioned before, the idea about hosting this conference started uh, with a suggestion I had and a proposal I submitted to the Center of, for Middle Eastern Studies. It quickly generated momentum amongst colleagues here at UT, especially in the wake of the widely media mediatized European crisis surrounding the refugees. For those of us whose professional and oftentimes personal links to Syria had been much older, the war 
and later the refugees had been topics of concern at least since the spring of 2011 when many of the events that led to the current situation began. Although I never formally conducted research in Syria, my personal involvement with the country started over 20 years ago when I spent extensive periods of time traveling, often by foot or hitchhiking through areas around Damascus and Aleppo, all the way to the coastal plains of Latakia and back east to the deserts along the Euphrates and the shores of the Tigris on the border with Turkey and Iraq. I continued to visit Syria even after I lived in Lebanon for three years when I conducted research, ethnographic research, among queer identified men, some of whom originated from Syria. My direct involvement with Syria came to an end after I entered the country um, for the last time, which was actually in the spring of 2012. The popular uprising had begun a year earlier, and a ghostly atmosphere enveloped the highway from uh, the border with Lebanon to Damascus. The capital itself was under the spell of a perpetual state of emergency, with the eerie staccato of pedestrian lights, which always went on when one crossed the emptied streets, was akin to a spark plug firing and almost mimicked mutely the ever approaching salves that one could hear being fired on the outskirts of the city. When I returned to Beirut the next year, Lebanon had been teeming with Syrians, including some friends and acquaintances I had made over the years. My research quickly shifted to hospitality as a philosophical concept and to the sociological notion of the stranger by focusing on the discourse of familiar phobia and the various strange aspirations gay Syrian refugees express in terms of language and bodily practices in and around Beirut. Most of them had been persecuted in Syria due to their sexual orientation and some due to their political views. Following their day-to-day -day lives in and around uh, professional and intimate settings, I started reconstructing the fallacies of the ordinary refugee experience as manifest in and around several Beiruti neighborhoods. I examined how these refugees contest and appropriate along literal and symbolic lines, a hostile urban fabric they are compelled to navigate on a daily basis. While all of them were officially registered with the UNHCR, some of these men sought and actually received political asylum in Western countries, mostly in Western Europe. And in particular, I tracked the life of one individual I had met under completely different circumstances in Damascus more than a decade earlier. And in so doing, I focused not only on the way in which he navigated the violent realities of a refugee between Damascus first, later on he actually went to Dubai, Beirut, and eventually Rotterdam in the Netherlands, but also on how he and his friends made discursively sense of place and its infrastructure in an increasingly globalized world where the experience of an asylum-seeking refugee has become a pivotal one. Albeit with different emphases, most of the panelists today may have similar stories to tell, stories that draw attention to their respective scholarly but also personal involvement with Syria, the war and the refugees. Some of us present here today met during last year's meeting of the American Anthropological Association when Anne Stahl, the former chairwoman of the AAA's executive program committee, asked me as an outgoing member of that committee to organize some sort of a panel that engages with the current situation in and around Syria. As the program back in November 2015 stated, this special event was intended to shed light on the unfolding Syrian civil war and the resulting refugee crisis. The idea was to bring um, together anthropologists whose professional expertise was either the study of contemporary Syria or and uh, the present day Syrian refugee crisis. And based on this expertise, the goal was to provide a forum uh, 
for an open and exploratory conversation among interested parties, something we hoped would also resonate with participants of last year's annual meeting of the Middle East Studies Association, MESA, that was also taking place in Denver at the same time. So bringing these, this timely discussion on the subject of the war in Syria and the refugee crisis to our professional association would enable us, we believed, to reflect on possibilities for engagement and directions for future work and collaborations. So part of that future work and collaboration is today's conference which has also garnered interest, I am happy to report, among the editors of the series in public cultures of the Middle East and North Africa at Indiana University Press. This will allow us to publish most of the papers that will be delivered today, as well as a few others by authors who could not travel to Austin this time, in an edited volume we think will be widely used in classrooms and other educational settings. Although we are faced with one of the greatest human tragedies following the end of World War II, with an internal death toll some experts argue to have reached half a million individuals, there have only been very few academic conferences in the US so far that focus on the war in Syria and the resulting refugee crisis. Most of them are concerned with issues regarding policy and the spurious question, what can we do to end the war in Syria? Notwithstanding the most imperious or mostly imperious use of the personal pronoun we, I do not discount the relevance of policy studies. This conference, however, focuses on the human dimensions of the war and draws on the scholarly knowledge of US-based and international academics in the fields of the humanities and the social sciences. Established scholars, junior researchers, and practitioners in the field with a variety of backgrounds regarding Syria and refugee studies will speak on subjects that range from the politics of nationalism and sectarianism in Syria to the collective and individual experiences of Syrian refugees in neighboring Arab countries, as well as in Turkey and in Europe. The conference is divided up in three panels with a total of nine speakers who will talk for 30 minutes each. The panels are chaired by three graduate students, Kate Maddox from Middle Eastern Studies and Ejay Sultan and Dina Rabia uh, both from the anthropology department. The first panel, The Nation and the War, features four speakers and is divided in two parts by a short coffee break. The panel's discussion is Jason Brownlee, who is on the faculty of the Go Department of Government here at UT. He will close the panel with a questions and answers period. And after lunch, we will reconvene for our second panel on Syrian journeys of displacement, which will feature three speakers and Ben Brower from the UT History Department as a discussant and a moderator for the Q&A. Our third and last panel today focuses on Palestinian refugees and the war and includes two speakers, one of whom will be present via Skype the discussant for that panel will be Stephanie Mulder from the Departments of Art and Art History, as well as of Middle Eastern Studies here at UT. And now, finally, let me welcome you all to our first panel of In and Out of Syria, a conference on the war and the refugee crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, hi, I'm Kate Maddox. I'm a, a graduate student in the Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at UT, and I'll be chairing this first panel. It's titled The Nation and the War. Um, the first presenter will be Dr. Yasir Munif, who's an assistant professor at the Institute for Liberal Arts at Emerson College, and the paper he'll be presenting is titled Nation Against State, Popular Nationalism and the Syrian Uprising. 
Then we'll have Dr. Frederike Stolleis um, from the Frederick Ebert Organization in Berlin. And she will be speaking about um, <clears throat> the politics of sectarianism in Syria. Next speaking will be Dr. Ziad Majid, Assistant Professor in the Department of International and Comparative Politics at the American University of Paris. His paper is titled War, Lies, and Videotapes. And finally will be Dr. Lisa Widin, Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. And she will be presenting her paper on uncertainty in Syria. The discussion of this panel, as uh, Sofian mentioned, is Dr. Jason Brownlee, Associate Professor in the Government Department here at UT. And there will be a half hour for questions and answers following Dr. Brownlee's remarks. Thank you. I should say a few words about um, myself because before I begin uh, my presentation. Um, my, my work since 2011 uh, has been re revolving around the politics and geopolitics of knowledge production uh, as part of an ongoing uh, revolution. And um, I've been trying to understand and uh, think about the different ways why there is so much conflict about understanding what's happening in Syria. Uh, what I call the unthinkable revolution. Why is it that people on the ground see what is happening and, and uh, label that and understand that as, as a revolution? And others um, uh, um, describe it as uh, a conspiracy theory and as intervention and as part of international politics and, and so on. And in the end, uh, I think what uh, really uh, uh, makes sense or made sense to me uh, as, as part of this uh, project is uh, basically try to understand the conflict and uh, the tension between micropolitics, you know, international uh, relations and uh, uh, intervention and civil war, uh, all these macro processes and micropolitics, uh, 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 what's happening on the ground, the micro practices, what people are doing uh, and how they're resisting on an everyday uh, basis. I'm Syrian. I lived in Syria for uh, many years. Uh, and I've been going back to Syria more recently, since 2011, in the beginning to, to Damascus, but then uh, because of the organizing and um, fear of being caught by the uh, Syrian regime, uh, I started going to the northern areas um, through Turkey, smuggling through the borders, um, not showing my passport and, and so on. And I stayed in uh, a small city uh, in northern Aleppo, in the countryside of Aleppo, um, Menbij, uh, for three months. Uh, mid-2013 and early 2014. Uh, and then ISIS um, took over the city and it became impossible to go through those areas. Um, and many of the people I was working with, many of the people who were part of rebuilding that society, rebuilding some of the institution, left the country and are currently either in, in Turkey or a uh, different part of Europe, Germany, France, uh, and elsewhere. And so before I start uh, um, talking about you know, this notion and opposition between what I call popular nationalism, uh, what people have been uh, producing as a form of resistance, as a weapon against the state-sponsored uh, 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 nationalism or official nationalism. Um, I will say that uh, it's important not to um, present the Syrian revolution in, uh, as a singular nar narrative. There are always those different, you know, and overlapping uh, maps or narratives about Syria. Uh, and I think that has been really a major error in trying to, um, you know, talk and produce knowledge about, about Syria. Uh, sometimes you hear people talking about a sectarian conflict, um, opposing Sunni and Shia, and behind them there is Iran and, and uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia and so on. Um, proxy wars, uh, there is also the global jihadist uh, narrative has been really dominant and hegemonic since 2014. Um, for uh, some time, people were very interested in the Kurdish struggle for self-determination. Um, more recently, and uh, even in the beginning, the confrontation between Russia on the one hand and the West on the other, and so on. And for the most part, in all these narrative, uh, what's missing is uh, the Syrian revolution, the, what I'm calling the unthinkable revolution. Uh, because we're lacking some of the tools that are necessary to comprehend uh, what's happening. Um, the second thing I would say is that oftentimes what happens when people talk about Syria is the conflation between, um, you know, the military dimension and, and, um, and uh, the conflict in Syria. And I think the military 
confrontation is, is important, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. What's beneath it, what's, you know, what's really happening in Syria and what's most important is the civilian struggle, what people are doing day in, day out. Uh, the different ways and the different institutions they're creating, uh, discourses, identities, uh, narrative stories uh, that you know, they're producing uh, to understand, comprehend, resist, and um, produce a different uh, or post-Assad post uh, Syria. And that includes dances, slogans, graffiti, videos, plays, um, and so on and so forth, and also uh, uh, an alternative uh, history. Uh, and finally, um, it's important to think about the Senate Revolution on the long durée. Um, what happens oftentimes is reducing uh, our understanding on what happened in the past 18 months, two years. And I think this is uh, really reductive and, and limited. Uh, in our understanding of a revolution. I mean, any, any scholar of, of revolutions will tell you that uh, in order to produce an adequate uh, understanding of you know, the processes on the ground, we have to think about several decades, two, three, maybe five decades, to understand what's happening in the Arab world. And that's also been missing uh, in, in Syria. So now, to, to begin my talk about uh, the question of nationalism, what I'm to, uh, uh, calling popular nationalism, and, and the production of those national identities, uh, on the one hand, and um, and how they're uh, being produced to resist the uh, the nationalism produced by the Syrian state, uh, the state-sponsored, the Ba'ath Party, centralized kind of uh, nationalism. Um, and I'm suggesting that the Syrian revolution can cannot succeed unless uh, Syrian produce a popular uh, nationalism. Uh, this you know uh, uh, identity or this narrative, the story that is necessary as a glue. Um, you know, to, to, uh, to produce an alternative or post-Assad uh, Syria. Um, and the Syrian revolution is facing, uh, obviously, powerful ideologies um, opposing that narrative of the popular nationalism that was very po powerful and dominant in the beginning, 2011, 2012. Uh, some of those narratives are about a global Sunni jihadi, um, you know, ideology, uh, Shia uh, ideology, uh, jihadism, uh, all these uh, different narratives about anti-imperialism and anti-Zionism uh, for some of the players backing the Syrian regime, the ethnic and sectarian belongings that also have been very powerful in, you know, in some of the ways people have been trying to understand what's happening in Syria, the regional and tribal identities uh, within Syria, people belonging to the north, to the south, to the uh, coast, and, and so on. And then the official nationalism of the Syrian regime, uh, which I will talk uh, about in, in a minute. Uh, and most of these discourses function beneath or above the nation. Um, so, you know, for the Sunni and the Shia jihadism, as we can see it, uh, for, for ISIS and for uh, some of the uh, Shia, the borders are not very relevant. I mean, you can remove, it, remove them very easily and uh, still function and, and be able to produce a narrative that is... Um, logical and rational for, for, their, for their audiences. Uh, and some of them are beneath, are functioning beneath the nation. So for some of those, you know, discourses about uh, regionalism and about uh, belonging to Aleppo, and we, we've seen some of those tensions uh, happening, Aleppo as opposed to Damascus, the countryside as opposed to the city, and, and so on. Uh, and so I contend that uh, without a powerful popular nationalism, the Syrian revolution is bound to fail. And to demonstrate the point, I will avoid academic discussion about you know, the literature on nationalism and focus on concrete example about the meaning of popular nationalism in the Syrian uh, context today. Since the beginning of the Syrian uprising in March 2011, Syrians have been actively uh, producing a new form of, of nationalism. Uh, and here I understand um, I'm proposing uh, you know, a definition of, of nationalism as a contested terrain, as, as a, a battleground, as um, uh, a, a battleground where you know you have different players and different forces uh, trying to push for uh, uh, for um, different and opposing uh, narrative and, and discourses. And the paper examines popular nationalism in Manbij, a city in the Aleppo province located in northern Syria. Uh, the city, I think, provides an excellent site for the study of different aspects of popular nationalism. And the talk is based, as I said, on, on this research I've done uh, in 2013 and early 2014. The, the regime is obviously proposing an official narrative to counter popular nationalism, 
uh, both nationalism, popular and official, are competing for hegemony. Um, and as I said, um, it's a matter of existence uh, for both parties, uh, for both players. Um, the, uh, the groups uh, um, uh, allied to the Syrian revolution and, and the, the Syrian state. Um, and, and those narratives also uh, go, uh, go on in parallel with the military confrontation that is currently taking place in, in Syria. The popular nationalism is a primary tool of resistance against the Syrian regime. And as such, it aspires uh, to delink from official nationalism, uh, the official uh, ideology of the Ba'ath Party and the Assad regime. Uh, and the construction of popular nationalism requires a serious in engagement with the history of nationalism in Syria, which dates back to the turn of the 20th century. Unlike state-sponsored nationalism of the Ba'ath Party, popular nationalism is grassroots, bottom-up, and liberatory. It's hu uh, uh, humanist. It first emerged uh, to oppose the oppression of the ruling classes as well as the domination of the colonial powers. The emergent popular nationalism in Syria since 2011 should be understood as both a rupture with the state-centric nationalism of the Ba'ath Party and a continuation of the early popular nationalism of, the, uh, of 1920 and 1925 and 26, um, the, uh, the, Syrian, uh, the great Syrian revolt of, of that period. Popular nationalism is operating a dual move that alternates between the linking from the, an oppressive and centralized nationalism of the Ba'ath Party, which represents state terror and connecting with, uh, and at the same time, connecting with democratic, decentralized, and multifaceted popular nationalism of the early 20th century. So just to give you a background about uh, that early nationalism of, the, uh, of uh, 1919 and 1920, 1925, during the autumn of 1919, a broad coalition of intellectuals, notables, uh, lower middle class religious dignitaries, Qabadayat, and merchants was formed. They opposed King Faisal government, which they viewed as illegitimate and controlled by foreigners. They created democratic popular committees in many main neighborhoods. Uh, for the first time, Syrians from all social, social backgrounds became involved in politics through popular committees. <laughs> Not only did Syrians take matters in their own hands by creating a structure of democratic committees at the neighborhood, municipal, regional, and national levels, these committees threatened the power of the centralized government and they rendered local politics obsolete, um, while at the same time, they made national democracy uh, democratic politic, uh, commonsensical choice. And remember, you know, at the early beginning, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, there was a lot of local politics, regional, tribal, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, the creation of the municipal uh, com communities and uh, those uh, popular committees uh, really undermined that, uh, that uh, local uh, politics, uh, the politics of, of the notables. They were performing a number of tasks, including guaranteeing a fair price uh, for grain, recruitment of uh, volunteers for a com committee of uh, national defense, and providing relief uh, to the dis displaced and the poor. The parallels between the popular nationalism of 1919 and uh, 2011 are striking. Although explicit connections might not exist between the local coordination committees, which were formed in many neighbors, uh, neighborhoods in 2000. Um, uh, in August 2011 and on, <clears throat> and the popular committees of 1919, the emergence of both in a moment when the state is experiencing a deep crisis is by itself telling. The popular nationalism of the early 20th century uh, and uh, the early 21st century have both created new institutions, <laughs> cultures, and um, a viable, so viable societies. In both cases, nationalism was not simply concerned about sizing state power, but rather about creating parallel structures uh, to the state that would ultimately undermine the existence of the colonial and neo-colonial state. And this is important because, as you can see with the popular committees um, in, uh, in, in uh, Syria uh, since 2011, they're not necessarily concerned about sizing you know, state power, but about creating all these different, different uh, uh, institutions and discourses that are necessary to make their cities uh, livable and viable, uh, despite the bombing and the state violence and uh, the, um, the, you know, the state terror. The Great Revolt uh, of 1925-26 was a catalyst for the propagation of a Syrian Arab identity in the countryside. To counter the successful resistance in the countryside, French authorities produced a lot of propaganda explaining that 
The revolt is not sustainable because the feudal elite cannot convince peasants to join their cause. They also distributed leaflets explaining that the revolt is sectarian and that non-Druze, because the Druze were uh, obviously um, uh, playing a major role, they were in the leadership, um, that, that the, the French explaining that the revolt is sectarian and that non-Druze would, uh, would oppose it. The French op uh, propaganda was obviously ineffective. Peasants were willing to set uh, their class differences aside and join the battle against French uh, colon colonization. The Druze peasants in the south and Sunni and Christian grain merchants in Midan quarter in Damascus built an organic relationship through commerce um, because uh, the Druze region in uh, um, southern uh, Syria uh, was producing most, much of uh, or most of the, the grain and they had built uh, an important relationship between countryside, uh, the production of the grain and the merchant in Damascus um, through, that, uh, through that circuit. Um, when French bureaucrats introdu introduced new policies that threatened their livelihood, Syrians quickly built a network of resistance that spanned from the Druze mountain in the south to Damascus. Druze, Christians, and Sunni were willing to cross sectarian lines to protect their economic interests and livelihood. What is important to note is that the rebels <coughs> used flexible discursive strategies to undermine French power. In some cases, they advocated for Muslim uh, solidarity. In others, they were, uh, they were propagating tribal uh, culture and so on. Uh, while at times they highlighted class conflict, but they mostly used uh, nationalist discourses. They maintained a fluid meaning of what it means to be a Syrian or an Arab. And this openness allowed different groups to join their battle um, and consider the combat of the colonial power as their main goal. The Great Syrian Revolt of 1925-26 generated a blend of Syrian and Arab nationalism based on loose meaning of patriotism, anti-colonialism, religion, and tribal, tribal honor. The French occupier lost no time to label the rebels as extremists, criminals, terrorists, and sectarian individuals who were concerned only in preserving the feudal system in Horan. Uh, they used counterinsurgency and mass killing to quell the revolt. The aerial bombing, and that is one of the first aerial bombing uh, in, in history. Um, the, um, The aerial bombing was unprecedented at the time and punished the entire population of the region wherever the rebels uh, took refuge. Uh, Al Hariqa in Damascus was bombed for two consecutive days to drive the rebels out. Military might was always combined with the discourse to delegitimize the struggle of the revolutionaries. The French produced a counter narrative about the sectarianism of the Druze to deter other religious communities from joining the struggle of the rebels. In addition, the French formed sectarian militias made of Armenians and Cir Circassian to ignite sectarian violence, but the, re the rebels responded by reminding Syrians that all sects, uh, including Christian, Druze, Alawite, uh, Shia, and Sunni, are sons of the Syrian Arab nation. And this is between quotation marks. This is the language that they were using uh, at the time. France resorted, resorted to all forms of collective punishment and terrorization, including aerial bombardment, house demolition, public hanging, and displacement of entire population from, from different regions. On the long term, the asymmetrical power of the French and their counterinsurgency tactics were effective since the sympathy for the rebels gradually declined. When the revolt was finally crushed, 6,000 rebels were killed and more than 100,000 civilians were displaced. So now Arab nationalism after independence, um, 1946, um, that's when the French uh, left Syria. So the second moment I explore briefly here is the Ba'ath Party authoritarian rule since 1963. The history of the Ba'ath Party uh, and the rise and its rise to power um, is beyond the scope of this paper, uh, but suffice it to say that the period from 1946, when Syria became independent, to 1963, when the Ba'ath Party has power, was a tur turbulent one. Nationalism, uh, nationalists, communists, and Islamic groups were competing for power, sometimes using democratic means, while at others deploying force and military might. The intellectuals of the Ba'ath Party produced very rigid meanings of Arab identity that led to the exclusive uh, brand of Arab nationalism, oftentimes very chauvinistic. And here you see the, uh, the difference between the nationalism of the early 20th century, which was popular, which was not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, the production of literature and books and, and discourses, but about practices uh, producing different 
you know, discourses and, and institution uh, to resist uh, and, and, and oppose uh, the French. Whereas with uh, the Ba'ath Party nationalism, uh, clearly you see the production of a nationalism that was interested in sizing state power and in dominating uh, the political scene. Uh, the, Ba'ath, uh, the intellectuals of the Ba'ath uh, produced very rigid meanings of Arab identity that led to an exclusive brand of Arab nationalism. In that regard, the nationalism of the Ba'ath was unlike the 1920s, uh, nationalism, um, nationalism. Nationalists of the 1920s created a popular nationalism, while nationalists of the 1950s were interested in sizing uh, state power. In the first case, nationalism was inclusive, and here I'm talking about the early nationalism of the uh, 1920s. It was inclusive, organic, anti-colonial, and in second case, uh, 1950s, 1960s, it paved the way for an authoritarian, exclusive, neo-colonial nationalist uh, state. The former created a nationalism that could be, uh, that um, could have produced a post-national or post-colonial state, while the latter used the state to produce and legitimate a discourse uh, envelope, enveloped in uh, a national rhetoric. So now the, the current uh, revolt. Um, in the current revolt, two nationalisms are competing for dominance. The first one is popular and anti-dictatorial, while the second is official and claims to be anti-imperial and anti-Zionist. The first one resonates with the nationalism of the great revolts of the 1920s, while the second is the here of pan-Arabism of the 1950s and 1960s. The current uprising is producing a new nationalism that strives to delink gradually from the state-centric nationalism of the Ba'ath Party and reinvent itself in part by connecting with the nationalism of the 20th century. And this is um, you know, a process, an ongoing process, where you see the popular nationalism of you know, the, the, early, um, uh, in the early part of, of the revolt in 2011, trying to reject and, and delink from that nationalism of uh, the Ba'ath Party um, that's 50, 60 years old. Uh, and at the same time, trying to link uh, with the popular nationalism of the early uh, 20th uh, century. The process of delinking is delicate and at time costly. Uh, it is performed, if it is performed too slowly, it could be co-opted and subverted. And we've seen that with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, um, with the Syrian uprising in 2011. If you go too slowly, uh, obviously other groups um, with Islamist ideology, with uh, sectarian uh, uh, discourses and narratives uh, could co-opt you know, that, uh, that uh, momentum. If it is too abrupt and destructive, it can leave a void that other competing groups are more than willing to fill. Um, so if it's qu too quick, it's also uh, problematic. And the question is to find the right balance between you know, uh, the, the pace at which you want to produce that popular nationalism, um, which is uh, very tricky. Um, this explains why supranationalist and infranationalist groups such as the Islamic uh, coalitions or Kurdish tribal and regional communities are dominating the scene uh, today. To explore the significance of the emergence paradigm, I focus on Manbij, which is the strategic space uh, for the study of the various moments of popular nationalism. The northern city provides an excellent point of entry for the exploration of three vital moments um, you know, in the study of that popular nationalism. The first moment of popular nationalism takes place during the early period of the revolt be, uh, before the liberation of Manbij, the city where I, I spent almost three months in northern Syria. This period is characterized by subterranean nationalism that tries to find its way to the surface. It's clandestine nationalism that could be explored in marginal locality, localities or at nightfall when most public spaces are deserted. The prison is one such space where activists and organizers started creating new imagined communities when the revolt was in its early phase. And here I'm talking about Menbej when, it's still, uh, when it, uh, it was still um, controlled and dominated by the Syrian regime, the military and the police were still there. And so uh, the, you know, this, the emergence of that early nationalism uh, could operate only in those marginal spaces, including the prison. And I did multiple interviews where I talked to people telling me that for the first time they could connect with people from different parts of Syria uh, when, they, uh, when they were put with activists from Damascus, from Aleppo, from Manbij, from Makkah. And um, for the first time, you know, they had this face-to-face -face kind of uh, uh, discussions about the future of Syria, what kind of Syria they, they desire, uh, and so on. 
and those spaces were obviously lacking before before that. So it's interesting to look at at prison as a state, uh, as as a space of um, uh, of um, of production for that popular nationalism I'm, I'm talking about, which is uh, quite uh, ironic. Um, clandestine nationalism in the early um, the early nationalism of the Syrian uh, revolt uh, is a clandestine nationalism, as I said, and it was trying to find its way to a large audience under extremely challenging conditions. This is why it developed in dangerous and marginal spaces and was used to resist um, the oppressor. Uh, like popular nationalism of the early 20th century, which emerged as a tool of resistance against French hegemony and colonization, the nationalism of the uh, 2011 revolt should be understood as an essential tool to oppose the violence of the regime and ultimately topple the Syrian despot. despot. To explore this form of um, nationalism, we have to explore uh, the work of clandestine committee um, that started forming in many cities, including Manbij. And here I'm, I'm going to skip a few, um, few pages. Uh, but when I talked to people on, on the ground, they told me that they were able to build an impressive network of popular committees without the regime ever knowing what was happening. Uh, they had 50 groups in, in Manbij, and when the regime left the city, um, overnight they were able to take over the city, and um, there was no violence, um, um, uh, no crimes committed in, in the following week because they were so present, but they were clandestine, they were uh, underground. Um, the second dimension or the second phase, uh, the second moment of that popular nationalism is after the liberation of the city. Uh, and I call that decolonial nationalism. And it's about uh, cleansing the city from all the symbols and uh, the, the slogans of the Syrian regime. And there are many different facets to that uh, from uh, Cleaning the streets to uh, to putting different slogans on on the um, on the, the walls to producing street festivals and uh, uh, um, theater and dances and and so on uh, to the production of different uh, um, you know narratives and institutions the revolutionary council and the revolutionary uh, trustee council. Um, and the takeover of different institutions, the production of alternative uh, discourses and narratives and, and so on. And that's all part of the process of uh, decolonizing your own city, decolonizing your own uh, spaces um, that, um, that happened during that period of almost 18 months between the liberation of the city and the takeover by ISIS, which is the third moment um, in, in, in that um, uh, uh, short history. And that third moment is what I'm calling the incubator nationalism. When people uh, were threatened by ISIS directly, many people were killed, many people were put in prison, and they had to go back to the private space of the home. Uh, and actually, a number of uh, youth created uh, this, um, this um, center they called home um, in English um, and Arabic. Uh, and where they were teaching uh, the youth uh, languages, uh, trying to teach, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, creating spaces for uh, performances, uh, theater and um, uh, painting and, and so on. Uh, and um, when I asked them why, why they felt that there was the need for such a space, uh, one of the, um, the organizers of, of HOME said, um, he explained that the Syria we were dreaming of and aspiring to create is becoming an illusion. Sectarianism and fundament fundamentalism are eating up our Syria. Uh, I'm, I'm quoting him here. Uh, and this is why we felt the need to create um, that space, a home to preserve whatever can be preserved, and start planning all over again. And oftentimes they compared ISIS to the Syrian regime and that we have to start all over again with a minor difference. Um, ISIS had the name of all the activists and knew all the major players and so on, um, and uh, could easily target them, expel them from the city, kill them, whereas the, um, the uh, Syrian regime didn't have um, that, those, uh, those lists. So in conclusion, the three phases of popular nationalism described above, na namely clandestine, decolonial, and incubator nationalism, show that um, the emergent paradigm is facing major challenges as it is developing and adapting. The nationalism that I describe in Manbij was primarily meant to counter the Syrian regime discourse about in, uh, inclusion to the Syrian um, nation state uh, and state power. Popular nationalism constitutes a culture of resistance 
that is delinking from the oppressive structures of official nationalism of the Ba'ath Party, while at the same time reconnecting with the early history uh, of Syria. The popular nationalism that developed in the early 20th century to resist French colonization, and the one that emerged in the past four years as um, an oppositional paradigm to Assad Syria, have much in common, as shown through the multiple narrative described above. Um, they are both non-elite culture that avoid following a script. They both develop through the everyday practices of mul a multitude of people. They are oppositional to state-centric nationalism that are perceived as oppressive and unjust. The popular nationalism is at a crossroads since it has been marginalized and challenged by state and non-state um, actors. Syrian popular nationalism is not only facing the nationalism of the state um, of the Ba'ath Party. In addition, it is competing with Muslim identities imposed by groups such as ISIS, Ahrar, Sham, and Nusra. In addition, it is challenged by sectarian and tribal identities operating in multiple localities. Finally, it is also being redefined by the nascent Kurdish nationalism in northern Syria. Some of these identities are operating below, while others are functioning above the nation state. They are all putting stress on popular nationalism to be more creative, open, and inclusive. This is one of the major challenges of popular nationalism in the coming few years, um, as the Arab and Syrian revolts are morphing and transforming. Thank you. I'll pick up exactly where you ended, I guess, because you were talking about the, the challenges to popular nationalism. And I will talk about sectarianism, which you mentioned also is um, the ugly counterforce or even the, the enemy of what you described of um, uh, popular nationalism. And I think it's important to talk about this because um, Sectarianism, or when, when talking about Syria, I think sectarianism is very often overestimated. When people describe uh, Syria, the, the conflict in Syria as a sectarian war, or even a war about the right interpretation of religion, I mean, this is certainly not a good way of reading what is going on. But at the same time, I think it's also underestimated the force of, of sectarianism. It's underestimated by analysts, but also by many uh, Syrian activists, especially in the beginning of the uprising. Um, but before I start, I'll say a few words about myself also. Um, when I first came to Syria in, in 1998 to do uh, research for my PhD thesis in anthropology for a German university, I did not imagine that I was going to spend most of the next 15 years in Damascus. Um, my research at the time was uh, on conservative Muslim women in Damascus and their distinctions between public and private life. So I spent much of my time in different women's circles, such as coffee mornings, reception days, and savings associations, having conversations with women and with men on how space and activities were divided according to gender, notions of modernity, and many, many other criteria. After completing my thesis in 2002, I went to Lebanon to work in a research project on uh, demographic changes of a Beiruti neighborhood. I went back to Syria after that to live with my husband, an architect from Damascus, and uh, later our two girls uh, in Syria. I, continued to work in different projects financed by the German Development uh, Corporation. Uh, first with the state institution, which was called the Agency for Combating Unemployment, which was um, an institution set up by uh, the, the new, more or less, uh, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad um, as part of the promised economic reform package. I was also for nine months with one of the developmental NGOs under the patronage of the First Lady, Asmal Assad, was called Fadoz. <laughs> and um, I have to say that both these uh, jobs were a very rich and interesting experience, which um, offered very troubling insights into the Syrian reality. Um, in my last few years in Syria, I joined UNRWA, which is the uh, UN organization responsible for Palestinian refugees in the Middle East. And this is where I was when in the, the end of 2010, um, 
we, like everybody else, uh, closely followed the, the Arab Spring, so-called Arab Spring, on, on TV. Um, yeah, until the Syrian revolution started in the small city of uh, Dara, south of Damascus, in March 2011. Um, and we stayed glued to the screens, waiting for it to reach the capital and topple the regime. And as you all know, that this never happened. <laughs> and almost one year later, after our last visitor, Sofian, as he mentioned, had packed his things and left, <laughs> and in February 2012, we also gathered our things together and moved to Beirut, um, where I started working with the German, politi German political foundation, which I'm still with until today, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And uh, in Beirut, I was for, for the three years to come, I was responsible for building up the foundation's uh, Syria office in Beirut which aimed at supporting civil society initiatives and individuals in Syria and the neighboring countries, of course, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Jordan at the time. Um, yeah, individuals or groups which aimed to, to lay the foundations for a democratic transition and peaceful coexistence in Syria. Um, in February 2015, exactly a year ago, uh, after most Syrians uh, I had been working with in, in Lebanon had already left to Europe or elsewhere, we finally moved to Berlin and um, basically followed the flow of Syrians. Um, and where I continue to work with the, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Just a more small footnote, although this is not the topic of my speech. I, um, in 2015, <laughs> in Berlin alone, 18 1,500 Syrians registered as refugees. So it's, um, yeah, wherever I went, there were many Syrians <laughs> in the last 15 years. Um, to come back to, to the topic, um, among the different failures of the so-called uh, Arab Spring in the Middle East and North, uh, North Africa, Syria is certainly the country which uh, is currently experiencing the most, its most cruel consequences. A horrendous war, human rights <coughs> violations of all kinds, and a humanitarian catastrophe which has entered its, its fifth year. There have been many attempts to explain why things in Syria developed the way they did. And one of the aspects mentioned again and again is the sectarian diversity, on which what was, is often labeled as a sectarian war is now uh, unfolding. Very often Syria is described as a sectarian mosaic that risks to fall apart. And this tends to give the impression of some kind of a sociological rule, like a logical consequence of the breaking down of a state rule, which previously guaranteed the, the coexistence of the various communities. Without any doubt, the integrity of Syria is currently being heavily challenged. The national borders are only partly under state control, and regional power struggles with a song, strong sectarian connotation, as well as interstate conflicts are overlapping and carried out on Syrian ground. Nobody will deny that sectarian identity, as well as notions of belonging to a certain regional or ethnic groups, group, are today assuming an uh, unprecedented importance. Nevertheless, I insist to argue that it's not the sectarian diversity as such that determines the development in Syria. If this was the case, this would imply that a thorough analysis of the different determining factors would have allowed to forecast how likely a certain country's population would be able to succeed in the uprising or not. And there have been interpretations like this. Why did Tunisia succeed? Because it's a homogeneous country. And why did Syria fail? Because it's so diverse. And I think this doesn't go far enough into the topic. Um, because such an analysis, if you, if you take the, these external factors and kind of calculate it all and come to the result, it excludes the, the influence and also the respons responsibility of, of the political relevant actors, which consciously opt for one action or another. I mean, there are actors in this, it's not only factors that determine the, the outcomes of, of a certain event. 
on the one hand, the influence of the regional powers such as Saudi Arabia and Iran, but also Turkey is well known. Syria has been turned into a playground of international power struggles, which can be understood in the context of the larger Shia Salafi competition in the area. This is what comes from outside, but there's something coming from inside also. And um, the, what we witness today, the, the upcoming sectarianism in Syria is um, also, and I will go into this uh, in more detail, is also the result of a policy which the Syrian regime has applied over decades and which has been reaching its peak in the last five years. The relations of uh, peaceful or almost or for long times peaceful coexistence that prevailed among the various ethno-religious groups in Syria undoubtedly stood out as a social specificity which accounted for part of the country's special charm. And I think everybody who visited Syria know, know what, knows what I'm talking about. And indeed, some high and low points notwithstanding, the various communities in Syria did live together, mainly peacefully over a period of many centuries. The tolerance shown by the various groups towards each, each other was a source of pride for many Syrians often looking down on neighboring Lebanon with its recent history of 15 years of uh, sectarian civil war. And many Syrians continue to refuse defining their identity through their belonging to a religious community or to use the term of minority, as this implies the acceptance of the sectarian division of society, which is an idea which they refuse because of the ideological background, similar to what Yasser described, but also on the basis of the lived experience of respective tolerance and coexistence. The peaceful surface, however, often concealed a sense of mistrust and prejudice based on sectarian affiliation, which was not uncommon among Syrians even before 2011. Although uh, topics such as sectarian identities or the relations between the different sectarian groups could not be discussed in public. They were a recurrent topic of private conversations, especially among the minorities themselves. In a country ruled by a regime that openly appointed people to positions of power and influence on the strength of their sectarian credentials, information on sectarian background of a person or group was often essential in order to understand the situation or to judge personal or professional possibilities and limits. To discuss ethno-religious differences in public, however, was equivalent to political dynamite and therefore taboo. Inciting sectarian tension was one of the standard accusations leveled at political dissidents in court, and it incurred a sentence of many years of imprisonment. The silencing of all debate on the sectarian makeup of the country did not succeed in banning it from reality, of course. On the contrary, it fostered ignorance about the religion of the others and thus nourished prejudice and sometimes far-fetched ideas about the way of life of people belonging to other sects. Just to give you an example of, of how this information was not <laughs> passed on, um, uh, at no time during schooling would a Syrian child learn which ethno-religious groups lived in his or her country. While religious uh, education is compulsory in all public schools, it di distinguishes only between Islam and Christianity, and the pupils are segregated accordingly. This means that Sunni, Alawites, Druze, Shiites, Ismailis and Yazidis all participate in Islamic education, without the differences between their religions ever being mentioned. Exploiting the mistrust created by ignorance, the Syrian regime has learned in its more than 40 years in power to play off the various groups against each other in order to, to maintain its hegemony. Many Syrians are aware of this and deplore the lack of information and opportunities for information exchange. And the resulting need for debate on the topics of Syrian identity and sectarian belonging has become evident 
over the last four years and projected these formerly taboo issues into the mainstream discourse. With the beginning of the Syrian revolution, sectarianism has become <clears throat> the subject of many heated debate. From the very beginning, the demonstrators were set to propagate sectarian slogans, the most famous of which supposedly was Alawites into the coffin and Christians to Beirut. Say it in Arabic so that it rhymes. It goes Al Alawi ala Tabut wal Masihi ila Beirut. <laughs> the demonstrators declared this to be regime propaganda. And actually, it was never really clear whether this was, whether it was really a slogan of a, of a, of a demonstration or it was uh, made up to scare the, uh, the mentioned minorities. So the, the demonstrator countered with uh, slogans with emphasized national unity. Again, the most famous is one, 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 the Syrian people are one, which is wahed, 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 shab, suri, wahed. Um, <clears throat> or, not Salafism, not, no Muslim Brotherhood, the revolution belongs to the people. To reply to the accusation of being influenced and or financed by Islamist movements abroad. Bashar al-Assad spoke about the threat of Islamist terrorism as early as in March 2011, in his first speech before the Syrian parliament, when demonstrations were still peaceful and Islamist slogans rarely heard. At the same time, the brutal <coughs> suppression of the, of the protests began. Many peaceful, open-minded activists of those first months were arrested and killed, shot by the security forces or tortured to death in prison. Many others went into hiding or fled the country. Islamist groups gained ground and the moderate and secular voices were forced into silence. Particularly harsh persecution awaited anyone who tried to play a mediating role, such as demonstrators who distributed flowers and water to soldiers, or minority community Syrians who joined the revolution or supplied humanitarian aid to displaced Sunni families. In a country where the free discussion of questions of identity had been suppressed for decades, the onset of a sectarian discourse caught the intellectual elite totally unprepared and led to a variety of reactions. The partly very emotional discussions and publications of the last four years are in stark contrast to the enforced silence over the past four decades. And this is a double-edged sword, sword, whereas the, a free and critical discussion of these issues is long overdue and essential in, the, in light of the current developments, the current focus on sectarian affiliations very often sidelines other more decisive factors in the Syrian conflict, such as or also the origins on the, of the conflict, such as uh, the development gap between rich and poor, rural and urban areas, and also the complex web of political and local relationships that often cut across religious and ethnic affiliations. One of the shortcomings of the Syrian opposition is undoubtedly that it has failed to attract more members of all religious groups. Of course, prominent and lesser known members of all sectarian groups are represented in the opposition and no community stands as a homogeneous block behind the regime. Most communities are divided on the issue of opposition, with regime supporters usually displaying <coughs> their views outwardly, while regime critics keep a low profile because of secu secu security concerns inside the country. <coughs> but members, in general, members of non-Sunni Sunni communities generally do not have a significant influence within the Syrian opposition. On the other hand, Bashar al-Assad presents himself as the sole alternative to Islamist terrorism and as the protector of minorities, a narrative that the regime has reiterated on every pos possible occasion for more than four years. This, most cynically, has proved to be a successful strategy in so far that as the international community has taken on board the idea that Assad is the better option or at least for the minorities, especially the Christians. <clears throat>
The site of ISIS perpetrating its publicly displayed and mediatized atrocities has meanwhile reinforced the fears of the various sectarian groups. But this conclusion ignores the fact that it is the Syrian regime itself which is mainly responsible for the danger that the sectarian communities are currently facing. As early as 2011, <clears throat> it relinquished its power monopoly and encouraged members of these communities to form militias, armed them and allowed them to set up their own checkpoints, allegedly for their self-defense. By doing so, it gave credence to the notion of a Sunni majority threatening the existence of the, man, of the minorities. By releasing Islamist prisoners and tolerating their coming to power as the Nusra Front and later ISIS, the regime reinforced the fears of the different sectarian groups in order to win their backing in its fight for survival. But the international community likewise bears part of the responsibility for the chaotic situation in Syria today. Its policy of non-intervention allowed extremist forces to become stronger, while all moderate and civil forces were abandoned to be slaughtered by either the regime or Islamist militias. Are non-Sunnis communi communities currently under threat in Syria? It's a question that is often asked. In areas governed by ISIS as, as well as some of the other Islamist groups, this is certainly the case. In the other areas, they are threatened by op oppression and war, just as all other Syrians are. It should not be forgotten that so far the Sunni population has paid by far the highest price in term terms of being victims of oppression, warfare and displacement. A specific threat to minority sectarian groups can be identified in the fact that they are perceived by many to be supporters of the Syrian regime. A perception that could lead to acts of collective vengeance in the event that the regime were to fall. This danger is most obvious for the Alawites, but it's certainly a concern for other communities too, causing some to support the regime primarily for this reason. Another threat lies in the scenario of a Syria governed by Islamists, in which non-Sunnis would have no future. But here again, it is important to bear in mind that in this case, all secular and moderate forces, including all civil society organizations, would likewise be under threat. The fate of Alawites, Christians, Shiites, Ismailis or Druze, therefore cannot be analyzed and discussed in isolation from that of the Syrian population as a whole. <clears throat> Despite the fighting, the human rights violations and all the atrocities, those struggling for the peaceful coexistence of all Syrians have not vanished. Many have gone into hiding or are keeping lo a low profile in order to survive the two-pronged op opposition of the regime and the Islamists. Syria remains a diverse country with virtually no region which is not home to a variety of sectarian and ethnic communities. It is important to note that local identities, such as being from Homs, rather than being Sunni or Alawite, often dominate sectarian concepts. There are many examples of contact, exchange and support among sectarian communities on a local level, but such interaction is invisible to the international media. Massacres that don't take place don't qualify it as headlines. It is important not to lose sight of the sensible, peaceful majority of Syrians who are threatened from all angles. They deserve international solidarity and support. Meanwhile, ending the Syrian conflict is the only way to salvage and re-establish the sectarian and ethnic pluralism, which allowed Syrians to live together peacefully for centuries before the Assad regime took over power and which it is to be hoped will continue to do so after its end. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank Sofian and thank uh, the colleagues who organized this day and uh, uh, to hope that uh, the presentation uh, would give uh, some info and some analysis on Syria. Uh, I will try in my presentation uh, first 
uh, to uh, quickly remind you of what I consider to be the five phases of the Syrian uh, revolution turning into an armed struggle and then into a war, and then to see why um, this Syrian revolution, this uh, Syrian uh, uh, conflict, the Syrian disaster, you might find lots of terms qualifying it. Most of the terms will avoid using uh, uh, revolution, will prefer to move into civil war, into war, into conflict, into uh, massacre, into tragedy, uh, for different reasons. Some of them are related to a certain value judgment uh, that they don't want to, uh, to have positively while describing the events. Some others are related probably to a different observation and reading of the Syrian uh, situation. But to just to start with and to, to tell you uh, um, about what I think are the five phases that we have uh, gone through right uh, until now at least, uh, you know that it started in March 2011. So we're talking about first phase until August 2011. Uh, that's why August will, will, will come yearly as a turning uh, point or as, as a date with uh, a major event that will change a little bit the configuration of the situation. So the first August 2011 is when the peaceful revolution uh, started to become more and more militarized. Uh, people were forced, in a way, to an armed struggle uh, due to the uh, extremely violent reaction of the Syrian regime against demonstrations, due to the fact that gatherings in public uh, places was becoming impossible. More and more people uh, were probably becoming convinced that this regime, like the Iraqi one, like the Libyan one, will not leave just with peaceful demonstrations. So more and more soldiers, officers left the army, more and more young men took uh, weapons. And in August 2011, we can start about a changing moment, about more and more an armed struggle, uh, replacing the first peaceful revolution without ending it, because that will continue until August 2012. So once again, it's in August, it's summer. In August 2012, the uh, more or less it will be the end of peaceful demonstrations that were going in parallel with the armed struggle because it will become an open war. Uh, it's the first time that the Syrian regime will use its airplanes uh, to bomb uh, neighborhoods of Aleppo and Damascus where the uh, re military revolution, if you want, imposed itself in some neighborhoods and controlled some neighborhoods. And in fact, those neighborhoods will be under the control of the opposition since that time, in Aleppo at least. So it's a turning point because airplanes were used, and now it, it became more than impossible, in fact. It, it, it was the end of the uh, demonstrations going in parallel with uh, the armed struggle. August 2013, once again we are in August, uh, the chemical massacre uh, that uh, the regime forces committed in the Ruta of Damascus, uh, where on the 21st of August, in, in one hour, uh, more than 1,400 civilians were killed. Uh, because of the sarin gas that was used. And based on that, many thought that was what was the only red line that the Obama administration uh, set for Syria and was violated, that this would lead to a certain international intervention, to a punishment, as it was said. And then we saw that there was a deal uh, with Russia uh, following which the regime delivers or, or uh, gives its arsenal of, um, of, of chemical weapon, and then it will escape any kind of punishment. Uh, it will gain impunity, in fact, and it will be restored uh, legally, in a way, in the international, uh, on the international level because of that agreement. So committing a massacre turned to become one way of recognizing a certain legitimacy for the regime uh, that denied first that it had the sarin gas, then denied committing the massacre, then accepted to give the, the arm of the crime. And we, we, we had a, a very bizarre and, and strange concept in international law, following which uh, the, the regime accused of committing a crime will give up the arm or the weapon of the crime, and then it will escape any kind of, of punishment. And I think that was a turning point in the Syrian situation, because it created a feeling that the Syrian people were abandoned, and that the international law was not designed to protect them, that they are not part, in a way, of, of the uh, uh, universal. They are not protected by universal values and, and universal laws. And I think the, the rise of Daesh will benefit, in a way, indirectly, from that specific moment. That's why the 2nd August, the August 2014, so we have o August 2011, 12, 13, and now August 2014 is just a few weeks uh, 
after Baghdadi declared his Islamic State, and the U.S. is preparing to intervene, and it will intervene just a few days after, in September, bombing some targets in Syria. So we're moving into an internationalization of the conflict, uh, Daesh being by itself an international actor, since it has jihadists from uh, different countries. Uh, there are already in Syria other jihadists, those who are not in media, uh, the Shia jihadists, uh, who in number exceed the Sunni jihadists. Uh, I'm talking about Hezbollah, the Iraqi militias, uh, the Afghani militias, uh, the Iranian officers fighting with the regime against the opposition and against, in some cases, the, the Sunni jihadists. So you have an internationalization with now the U.S. and the International Alliance bombing uh, in places in Deir Zur and Raqqa and in some areas around Aleppo, uh, positions or villages controlled by, by ISIS. Then, August 2015, Russia is preparing its intervention that will start in, in September. So once again, the, the summer of, of uh, 2015 is another turning point uh, with Russia saving the regime and maybe uh, making it possible for that regime to restore some, uh, to change the balance of power in the conflict itself, to change the configuration of the, of the conflict, and maybe to impose the regime as an actor in, uh, in a transition or in the post-revolutionary era if the military plan of Russia functions. So we have five summers uh, in Syria. We have figures that are... Uh, that, that confirmed the UN uh, formula about Syria being the worst humanitarian disaster since the First World War. Uh, some people evoke uh, more than 400,000 uh, people killed already. Uh, we're talking about 200,000 detainees and, and, and people who disappeared. Uh, we're talking about more than 11 million uh, displaced and refugees. So almost 50% of the Syrian population is not in, it, in its homes and, and villages and, and neighborhoods uh, now. Uh, seven uh, inside, 4.5 uh, outside. Uh, the demography of some countries is, is being modified, even if temporarily but still, when you have in Lebanon more than a million refugees in a country with four million uh, people, when you have in Jordan more than 600,000, uh, there are some important changes uh, taking place, not to talk about also the, the uh, Daesh or, or ISIS uh, modifying the border as well between Syria and, and Iraq. So in terms of figures, it is a disaster. And with all that time, with all those changing summers that are bringing each time uh, a new uh, actors to the conflict, new configuration to the conflict, with all the uh, human disasters, we can still listen or hear or see or, or, un or, or read analysis, reports, uh, in which uh, what is happening is a mixture of conspiracies, is uh, sometimes uh, stories and narratives are uh, rejected. It is about... Uh, uh, people moving through remote controls. Uh, it is about Islamist versus the regime, uh, reducing choices, either Assad or, uh, or ISIS. Uh, so we have sometimes geostrategic considerations replacing the whole Syrian people and replacing what's happening in Syria uh, in a way that uh, political sociology is not adopted anymore to read what's happening, uh, in a way that political science are rejected and we are much more about some borders, about Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, some ABC of international relations brought as if they explained the whole thing. So the question that uh, I think many, uh, at least myself and, and many friends, keep asking, why is the Syrian people invisible? why we don't uh, see the Syrians, the daily peop people in, in their daily life that, that uh, uh, you described, Yasser, uh, and, and that you talk about as well uh, when it comes to their, to their relations with their neighbors, whether it's based on sectarian question or on solidarity or on suffering all those consequences of, of the war, of the bombing, of the interventions. Why we don't see the Syrian people and their legitimate rights for a regime change or for uh, a better Syria or for dignity or... The Syrian people are... Uh, the absent uh, in this scene of uh, uh, political analysis, uh, geostrategic uh, question. And I think there are lots of reasons for that, and that's what I will try to, to talk about now. Uh, the first uh, being the one related to Assad's father, to Hafez al-Assad, who managed between 1970 and 2000 to uh, erase, in fact, the Syrian people from the uh, political negotiations that he always had with the West. Syria was never about the Syrian people. Whenever an ambassador, uh, foreign uh, 
officer, uh, official, uh, whenever there is a conference. Syria is not about the inside. It's about the outside. It's about the border. It's about the intervention in Lebanon. It's about the Iraqi uh, questions. It's about the Kurdish-Turkish dynamics. It's about the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's never about Syria the inside. The Syrian people were made invisible by this kind of, of politics. And it was not surprising under this to see that in 1982, a terrible massacre was committed by the regime in the city of Hama. And rare were the articles, rare were the uh, uh, media coverage of that, of that massacre. 20,000 people, some people say 17,000, others uh, might reach a 40,000 figure, uh, showing that we have uh, little information about what happened in 1982. It was not for many actors an important thing, as long as they were dealing with Syria, the one that occupies Lebanon, the Syria uh, involved in the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Syria fighting the PLO and then compromising with the PLO, uh, the Syria competing with Saddam of Iraq over the leadership of the Arab nation. Uh, and that started uh, as of 1970, when, when uh, Assad reached power in a moment when Nasser was not there anymore. So. Hama was absent, and in fact, I think it was a trauma for the Syrians themselves that they couldn't talk about Hama, they did not write about Hama. There were very few texts by Syrians. Uh, most of them were outside Syria, uh, in novels, uh, in, in, in some poetry, they evoked Hama. But uh, there was very few work within the memory of the Syrians about Hama itself, due to this question of uh, uh, not only of, of repression and of the, uh, of the regime, but of just completely deleting the Syrian memory, the Syria, the inside. And when the revolution started in 2011, I think many Syrians had in mind that while taking pictures and while uh, uh, documenting every single event, and if you go to YouTube and to Daily Motion, you have millions, not hundreds of thousands. In 2012, there was already more than a million video uh, on, on, on those uh, social uh, media networks. They wanted to document every single moment so that Hama cannot be reproduced. And they thought that in 82, the world did not see us. While now we are showing everything, so definitely the world's reaction will be different. Still, it was not different. And that's for them was another shocking question that you can see in many of the works, uh, many of the, of the drawings, many of the arts. The, the creativity of the, of the Syrian revolution was uh, incredible in that sense because they wanted to keep a trace of what they have been going through since they were afraid that once again, after optimism in 2011, that Hama uh, that is being reproduced now in most Syrian cities and, and, and places, uh, this might be forgotten if they do not make the effort to document uh, the work and to document what they have been uh, going through. So uh, why is this once again taking place? What happened in 2000 when Bashar al-Assad seized power? I think there are some conceptions, some, some perceptions of, of Syria in 2000 that uh, change a little bit, but change in the, in the, in the wrong direction uh, when it comes to the Syrian people, in the sense that if under Hafez al-Assad it was much more geopolitical questions and it was uh, 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 politics related to the region. Under Bashar al-Assad, some started to talk about Syria, the inside. However, they talked about the Syria, the inside, as if there is a president who is young, coming from the West. He did some of his studies in Britain. He's one of us, as Tony Blair said. Uh, so he might bring uh, some reforms to Syria. He cannot be cruel. He cannot be criminal because he studied in the West, which is by itself uh, a very strong culturistic uh, uh, notion that if you study in the West, it, you might become civilized. You might uh, kill your people less, uh, etc. And he has a very modern wife. Uh, uh, creating associations, uh, sponsoring events on women's rights, on childhood. Uh, so this young couple brought some optimism in many circles in the West that they will reform. Yeah? They will not deal with their society the same way. So you start to read some articles. There are some documents, people traveling to Damascus, uh, following the inauguration of restaurants. Uh, some associations are there, more and more tourism. Uh, and they start to, to look at Syria, the inside, however, now with a different perspective. So it's not about democracy and political reforms. Assad was more into this, what many of his advisors used to call the Chinese option. And so you reform economically, you liberalize economically, you open the market, but politically you keep the authoritarian rule. 
because people are not yet ready for democracy. And he kept saying it in many interviews. Oh, we need more education. People are not yet ready for democracy. We need more education. So the society is still in its childhood. Uh, it will never be recognized as an adult society capable of assuming some choices. We cannot reform politically. And those who will dare, in fact, in 2001, with what was called the Damascus Spring, some forums that were opened, uh, petitions signed by, by intellectuals calling for the end of the state of emergency, for the release of political prisoners, uh, for the return of uh, uh, political uh, opponents. Many of them will go to jail. Uh, then in 2005, another attempt with the Damascus Declaration. Most of the committee of the Damascus Declaration will go to jail. So nothing will change in that sense politically compared to the father's uh, uh, time. And uh, we were not yet into the, the, uh, uh, the violence that we, we, we're seeing now because challenging the regime was still political, was still through articles and, and petitions. And those who were daring signing them were sent to jail. While under the father, when they moved more into a kind of uprising in 82, uh, they were massacred. And before that, there was also another massacre in the Palmyre uh, jail in, in Tadmor. And you have lots of uh, work on that uh, that, pub that was published much later, uh, like the, the novel of Mustafa Khalife, like uh, uh, some uh, poems by Faraj by Rakdar. Uh, more and more now, you have some work that is being published on that. So 2011, if we go back to that moment with this modern president, uh, the one who is supposedly bringing some reforms to Syria, who might be the exception, as he pretended, in the Arab uh, revolutions. He said, I think, to the Wall Street Journal in January 2011, just two months before the revolution, that Syria will be an exception. Why? Because he said that our people support us and because they support our foreign policy. While in other Arab countries, revolutions happened because people were opposed to their government's foreign policies, meaning Egypt, uh, normalization with Israel, with the US. So once again, he will bring back the foreign policy to replace internal questions related to human rights, dignity, uh, uh, democracy in a way, and uh, overthrowing the regime. That would be the first slogans of the revolutionaries from day one in Dara'a uh, until, until today, in fact. What happened? while this uh, propaganda was, was put in place to say that our people support us, that the question is about foreign policy, it is the best way for conspiracy theory to find their, their basis, uh, to talk about uh, some regional actors wanting to destabilize Syria for its foreign policy. Uh, you might find uh, in the Arab world, as well as in the West, among many leftist circles, people who would consider that Syria is being targeted uh, by, by, by uh, conspiracies because of its position in support of Hezbollah uh, and, and uh, the Palestinian resistance. Uh, you will have people saying that it is due to the fact that Assad never signed peace with Israel. They are punishing him for that. Uh, then you will have, with time, um, other theories about Saudi Arabia and Qatar wanting to control uh, everything, and Qatar uh, wanting to have uh, gas pipelines going through Syria, and that Assad did not accept that. So once again, the Syrian people are absent in those narratives, and we're talking about regional actors uh, and not about what is happening inside. Now, with, with more and more uh, blood, with more and more violence in the Syrian conflict, you started to hear people uh, saying, especially in the West in this case, well, we don't know how to, uh, who's, who's killing whom in Syria. Uh, it's too complicated. Uh, the idea of a complicated Orient, of the complicated East, uh, will appear once again. So it's too complicated. We don't understand. And this will be an excuse not to support any policy towards Syria, not to support any position towards Syria, and not to, to, to express a certain solidarity among actors in, in Western civil societies uh, towards the Syrian uh, uh, tragedy. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we, there are uh, contradictory information. Some people are saying that there is no revolution. It's just Islamist against Assad. So what shall we do in these kind of cases? You have this argument. You have another argument uh, uh, that, unfortunately, President Obama made allusion to recently, that anyway, in this region, conflicts have been going on for, for forever. So we can't stop them. We can't do anything. People are, in a way, um, um, maybe it's a caricature now, but people are genetically violent. So we cannot stop, stop them uh, from killing each other. Conflicts might continue, and it continues, in fact. It's been now five years, and it's getting worse. So what shall we do? We cannot do anything. Uh, 
we don't want to intervene. No? But at the same time, they are intervening and they are all bombing ISIS or targeting uh, ISIS in some cases, not because ISIS killed Syrians or not because ISIS killed Iraqis, but because ISIS uh, uh, killed, in a barbaric way, uh, obviously, uh, Western journalists, and they were filmed by, by the cameras, because they have uh, shown their spectacular violence, and they wanted to show that spectacular violence. Uh, so we target them for that, but we don't want to intervene when it comes to those Syrians killing each other or uh, for a regime killing its, uh, its people. Once again, as if international law, Geneva Conventions, all settings that should regulate conflicts or end conflict cannot be applied in Syria because it's too complicated, because they're violent, and because the, 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 the conflict is so complex with all regional actors in it. Then you have the, what we might call the self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, it is not a surprise if you leave violence and violent mechanisms in a society that you will have violent reactions. Uh, it is not a surprise when you don't have political freedoms for more than 40 years, when you don't have political life for more than 40 years, that uh, against violence you will have violent uh, uh, reactions and responses. It is not a surprise when uh, you have uh, people abandoned and left to death, to the rituals of death, to funerals, uh, when you don't have actors trying to intervene in a way that would support some uh, political options by saying that anyway it's difficult and we don't know who's who, to have some actors who will find allies among Islamic groups. Uh, those Islamic groups will become stronger on the ground, uh, will have their discourse becoming more and more radical. Uh, Islam will become a refuge for them. Uh, the term Allahu Akbar will be their, their identity in a way because it mobilizes. Uh, for them, it is against fear. Uh, you will move from slogans in demonstrations that you mentioned, uh, Wahed, 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 Shaab al-Suri, Wahed, uh, we're one, the Syrian people is one, or Ash-Shaab, you read Isqat al-Nizam, the people want to topple the regime, or uh, dignity, freedom, etc. You will move to, oh God, we have no one but you, oh God, uh, Ya Allah, Malna Ghairak, Ya Allah. So you have, even when it comes to the term, you can see how the society is moving. And this does not mean that ideologically they are becoming into uh, Islamism as we understand it sometimes in the West. It means that the popular Islam, the one in conservative uh, areas where people are religious, is becoming their security belt, is becoming what, what protects them from fear and from the barrel bombs that are raining, uh, that are uh, destroying their neighborhood and, and daily lives. So you have this as a proof that, ah, we told you from the beginning it's Islamists. We told you from the beginning it's not a revolution. This is about those uh, extremist groups who want to topple the regime and who threaten the minorities. So the minority question will become also one important uh, issue. Uh, and the minorities, when we are only uh, dealing with them, it means also that we're forgetting the majority. Uh, there is only the fear for minorities, as if the majority that has been massacred since 2011 does not really count. We just scared because some Christians uh, might fear uh, the fall of the regime because Islamists will take power. We are scared because the Ismailis uh, might be in, in danger. So these kind of arguments also were messages to the majority, to the Sunni Arab majority, that uh, you're not equal to other Syrians when it comes to death because you're, maybe you're too many while uh, they are uh, small groups, so they might be exterminated while you're not. But this also means that uh, if thousands are, are dead, it's not the same impact that it has when it is about minorities. And I think this is a very dangerous message uh, related to the future of those societies and also related to the universality of, of human rights and of uh, the, 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 the value of life itself. Then you have scenes uh, that in my paper I'll, I'll try to elaborate more on, uh, scenes of uh, individuals uh, practicing some kind of barbaric, real barbaric uh, behavior. There is one video about a gentleman called Abu Saqqar. Abu Saqqar uh, promised, it seems, some of his uh, comrades that when he will uh, kill a Syrian regime soldier, he will eat his heart. So there was a video showing that, that Abu Saqqar starting to eat the heart of a dead soldier. That video will circulate all over social networks, in media. You will have a series of articles about it showing how barbaric those opponents could be. Uh, 
and saying that it, it, it is clear now that everyone is in this war, equally barbaric, so we can't do anything once again. While, uh, while Abu Sakar was doing this, eating a heart of a dead soldier, there were hundreds of people being killed or, or injured by uh, bombing, by, uh, by, by, by air raids, by torture in jails. But their death was abstract, was not seen uh, the same way. And they were once again forgotten. They became part of this invisible Syria. Then ISIS came. And of course, ISIS knew from the beginning that there is something sensational in the media. Uh, there is something exotic when it comes to violence with, with a knife when it comes to decapitation, uh, when it comes to execution life. It is not as when you use the modern weapons of the uh, 20th centuries uh, that the West is used to anyway. And you see an air raid, you see an artillery. It is not that shocking. Uh, it is part of any war or military scenario. But if you see people using and going back to primitive weapons, and they are filmed, and this is spectacularly well done, in fact, they have different uh, cameras filming that, uh, and they know that they should not do it daily or weekly, because otherwise it will become uh, banal or it will become something that media is used to. It will, it will lose its impact. They do it, they, they dose it, they do it once a month uh, to keep the media always alarmed about what Daesh is going to do. So they might decapitate a journalist, they would put a pilot in a cage and burn him. There is not only a criminal potential in Daesh, but there is also an, Im uh, an imagination of, of criminality that is extremely shocking. And that will once again replace the whole Syrian people, replace all the victims of uh, air raids, all the victims of, of torture, all the victims of bombing. Uh, and the media will find in this sensational uh, movies sent by ISIS a way of communication, once again, to show how this conflict is barbaric and we can't do anything, we cannot intervene. Then you have other things. Uh, and, and yes, I'm reminded that I still have five minutes. Uh, you have things related to uh, between Islamophobia, between um, that might unify people from left-wing background and right-wing background. Uh, either that the regime is more progressive than its own society, that conservative society, the regime is better than the society in a way because it tolerates uh, uh, some kind of uh, social conduct uh, that is more liberal, uh, more Western. Uh, you can, you, you're not obliged to put uh, a veil under the Syrian regime. You can consume alcohol under the Syrian regime, while this alternative will be a disaster for women's rights, uh, will uh, have lots of constraints on, on personal freedoms. And this might alarm some Syrians before, before telling about the West. But these kind of cliché will find those who will support it from one side. And it will be uh, put uh, at the same time with another discourse uh, related to the fact that we cannot consider that the same values apply in Syria as they apply here. Because there the cultural scene is different, traditions are different. Uh, we have a certain conception and a certain definition of revolution. Uh, it should be like the French Revolution. It should be like the American Revolution. It should be like revolutions that we know while what's happening there cannot be defined as a revolution. So in, in uh, using cultural specificities will be obliging uh, also uh, the Syrians either to follow some Western definitions of what a revolution should be or that what is happening there is just a civil war. Is there a civil war in Syria? Yes, in a sense. And any revolution uh, has elements of a civil war because any regime does have a certain social basis defined, defending it and consider, considering that its future is related to it. So there are aspects of civil war. But this cannot deny the fact that, and, and I will finish here, that there is in Syria today, and there has been in Syria in 2011, 12, 13, and 14, a revolutionary process that started by people in the society who wanted to change the regime. They are from a young generation. Uh, they don't want to uh, remain silent. Uh, they consider that their parents suffered in silence and they were not vocal enough. So they started demonstrations. Then they took weapons. Uh, in some cases, they were defeated. In some other cases, uh, foreign actors imposed themselves on the Syrian scene. Uh, they were marginalized. Some of them 
were converted to civil society activism in Turkey or in Lebanon or in Jordan or in Europe. Others are still working inside. There is a civil society inside. Imagine a country that's being daily bombed uh, by different actors and still you have some hospitals running in, in, in areas uh, that are not under the regime occupation, uh, some of them underground to protect them from the air raids. You have schools that are still running. You have the white helmets or the civil defense that is still saving people under the most difficult uh, conditions. Uh, you have people trying to find some ways of providing services. You have charity networks. So this is revolutionary in the sense that civil society in Syria was assassinated and now is being uh, once again reconstructed by the same Syrians who started the revolution and by the same Syrians who are keen on defending their memory and preparing a memory for the future uh, by documenting it. Uh, uh, and I will finish with the last word is that for any possible solution, it's not, of course, the, the, the topic of, of the uh, intervention, uh, to talk about a post-Assad Syria or about the future of Syria, what is definitely needed is to, to, to get rid of, of ISIS and, and Assad, and, and it is a condition. You cannot keep the Syrian people in this trap. You cannot keep them in this jail, either Assad or Daesh, because this is also a way of saying that you do not exist. You're either ISIS or Assad. Well, no, it's not true. It's neither Assad nor Daesh, and we cannot keep Syria without a certain form of justice, because impunity has been a disease in the Middle East. And if you keep impunity in that way, no one should wonder later why things are not uh, really good between different parts of the world. And the question, why do they hate us, uh, would be always uh, uh, present in some way or another. And this is not an excuse. Huh? It does not at all. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that it is a Western responsibility. It is an international responsibility and a Syrian responsibility, but one should uh, keep that in mind. Uh, otherwise, double standards will always create frustrations and will radicalize me people more. Sorry for being long, and thank you very much. On uh, behalf of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at the University of Texas at Austin, I welcome you back to our second panel. And um, essentially, uh, we have our chairwoman, uh, Eje Saltan, who will be briefly introducing the speakers, uh, who will be speaking 30 minutes each. After uh, that, uh, Ben Brower from the History Department will be discussing the papers and we will open up the floor to questions and answer before we will have a brief coffee break and after that, our final and third panel. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Um, I'm Edja Sultan. I'm a PhD student here in the Department of Anthropology at UT Austin. So welcome to our second panel titled Syrian Journeys of Displacement. And we have three speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Jonathan Shannon from the Department of Anthropology at Hunter College and CUNY Graduate Center. His paper is titled Sounding Home, Music and Nostalgic Dwelling Among Displaced Syrians in Turkey. And our second speaker is Mauricio Al-Bahari from the Department of Anthropology at Notre Dame University. And his paper is titled Facing Death a Million Times, Syrian Refugees' European Journey. And our third speaker is Julie Petit um, from the Department of Anthropology at University of Louvi. And her paper is titled Refugees in Motion and Spaces Along the Way, Theoretical and Methodological Changes of, uh, Challenges of a Changing Field. And after our speakers will um, hear our discussion, Ben Brower from uh, the Department of History here at UT Austin. And that's all I will say. <laughs> Thank you to Sofiane and all the organizers for putting this event together. I'm quite pleased and honored to be here, especially to be back at UT, my first post PhD academic home, so it's kind of a homecoming for me. Well, it's quite changed the campus. Anyway, let's see if this slide thing will work. I hope it does. Um, first of all, we all know the story about what's been going on in Syria, uh, at least the, some of the narratives, so I won't repeat them now in the interest of time. As a little bit of background, I conducted my major research in Damascus and Aleppo on musicians and discourses about music and modernity, uh, and then later on pursuing some similar themes in Morocco and Spain. So those are kind of the two bookends of my, my um, academic career 
up until now. I've also been working on a, 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 a larger book project tracing musical and culinary circulations around the Mediterranean since the early 18th century, um, as well as circulations of laborers and ideologies having to do with that region. And I came to this project, which is a new project, a bit reluctantly, partly because uh, most of my uh, Syrian interlocutors and friends uh, have suffered enormously, including paying the ultimate price of death um, during these various uh, events. And I was not happy with the ways in which many uh, people, not only in the academic community, it's understandable, but elsewhere were turning the Syrian tragedy to their own personal or, or professional profit. And I felt very reluctant, and still am reluctant, to use this as sort of uh, something for my academic mill, so to say, grist for my academic mill. However, I did want to do something that would allow my friends, many of them were close friends of mine from 20 years ago, uh, to give their voices to help humanize some of the discussions that we've had. And I think our early panel, the first panel today, pointed out very clearly that a lot of the discussion about Syria has not included the Syrian people themselves. They've been largely erased. And that's certainly been the case in American journalistic discourse with a few exceptions. And certainly political discourse has been uh, dehumanizing for the Syrian people. So I thought if I could help these people to articulate some of their visions, contradictory that they may be, then I can help to be what Ruth Bihar called a vulnerable witness to their suffering and perhaps raise some awareness um, aside from the other academic interests that we're all pursuing. No, this is not water from Michigan, Adriana asked me. It's just <laughs> electrolytes. Um, so of course, uh, the crisis or war in Syria has meant that I've had to follow the musicians to where they are. Many of them have ended up in Europe, but a lot of them have also ended up in Turkey and in Egypt. So that's where I spent the last summer uh, following them around in some preliminary research amongst displaced Syrian musicians, primarily those from Aleppo. Of course, for those of you who know Syria, Aleppo is the cradle of traditional music, not only in Syria, but in the Arab East, or Mashriq. Um, it's uh, got a very distinctive and distinguished uh, architectural, uh, culinary, musical, and literary, philosophical, political, and religious history that um, uh, the Aleppans are justifiably proud of. Um, with the destruction of the physical and social infrastructures of musical production, one of my questions was, what would happen to the music? And how are the people in displacement using their music to refashion their lives? So really, this is a, a, a two-pronged preliminary research um, proposal or, or set of proposals, really. First, how does expressive culture, especially musical performance and listening to music, contribute to productions of a sense of home and affective community for these displaced Syrians? And secondly, what is the role of these same Syrians as active agents in refashioning their musical traditions in uh, conditions of displacement. Um, prior to the war, musical performance was a very powerful medium for the expression of deeply felt sentiments about home and served as an important context for the creation and experience of forms of cultural intimacy and confidence. It was also a source of contention in the broader context of debates about modernity and selfhood. In conditions of displacement, what role might music play in refashioning these affective regimes? How might music serve not only as a source of comfort and nostalgic remembrance, but also as a touchstone for contestation and debate over collective memory and the meanings of belonging? How might music even be a source of conflict among Syrians in Turkey? What role can music help uh, play in helping displaced Syrians negotiate new urban contexts that have very different political, economic, and moral infrastructures, very different acoustic ecologies, to borrow from the work of Steve Feld, and a music market with um, differently constituted subcultures and scenes. So the second question asks to what extent these displaced Syrians themselves have played a role in the transformation of their musical heritage, both as performers and as listeners. Far from being passive victims, these Syrians in Turkey are agents in refashioning their lives and their cultures. Somehow Syria is trying to pick up my voice and no, I can't <laughs> displace Syrians. I'll find crazy, sorry. Um, Far from being passive victims, displaced Syrians in Turkey are agents in refashioning their lives and their cultures. How do they and their audiences in Turkey reshape and resignify the concept of tradition itself in circumstances that promote not only preservationist projects, but also innovation, fusion, or even loss? What new or hybrid forms do they create to give meaning to their experiences? How are repertoires, both musical and social uh, cultural, refashioned? especially when musicians are not formally or even adequately trained because they had to leave home before acquiring the necessary competences. How are their performances understood by new audiences in these new contexts? 
How do they shoulder the burden of maintaining a weighty musical tradition while far removed from the social context and built environments that nourished it? Might distance from Syria hamper their musical development, or might it in fact liberate them to explore novel areas of expression? By addressing these and related questions, my hope is that this research will add to our growing understanding of the important role of expressive culture in reconstituting home in conditions of displacement, as well as um, pointing out the active role of exilic and diasporic communities in cultural preservation, revival, and innovation. So during my preliminary work last summer in Istanbul, I spoke with about 30 musicians, uh, Syrians, mainly musicians and their family members, as well as many others, the large majority from Aleppo, and found that expressive culture, especially music and cuisine, serve multiple and at times conflicting roles for Syrians, at once a source of nostalgic, even painful remembrance of home, and also a source of debate about cultural identity, authenticity, loss, and renewal. For many, music and cuisine are important means for negotiating their subjectivities as Aleppans, as Syrians, or also as Muslims. In the context of displacement, I found that many of the Syrians whom I'd known earlier in Aleppo had, upon relocating to Istanbul, adapted more conservative some might even say intolerant views of family, community, nation, and faith. Not surprisingly, these more conservative views also found expression in sonic and gastronomic nationalisms that belied the diverse nature of the musical and culinary traditions of Aleppo. For others, especially younger Syrians and those hoping to emigrate to Europe, displacement in Turkey presented great challenges to survival, but also offered opportunities for growth, change, and development in new directions. Musical performance broadly understood including listening practices, as well as cuisine, foods prepared, eaten, discussed, and remembered, often reinforced these views as well. In this way, music and cuisine were important ingredients in negotiating and producing the contradictions of nostalgic dwelling in lived, and lived experience in displacement. I think I'm going to turn this off because Siri keeps responding <coughs> to my voice. Um, next slide. So these are the questions, sorry. Uh, there we go, Istanbul, sponsored by the Istanbul Tourist Board. Um, by late December 2015, the UNHCR reported registering over 2.5 million Syrian refugees in Turkey alone. This was a two-third increase um, since December of 2014. And the actual numbers, of course, are much higher. Over 50% of these registered refugees are age 17 or younger. Although the precise numbers are unknown, up to 350,000 Syrians have found refuge in Istanbul, while hundreds of thousands, of course, reside in cities, towns, and refugee camps along the Syrian-Turkish border, including, including in Gaziantep, a major, a major destination due to its proximity to Syria, the long-established Syrian communities there, and its award-winning baklava, recently announced as the best in the world. Um, in a competition, it's true. It would be difficult to generalize about the Syrian population of Istanbul because it consists of long-term and short-term residents, refugees and political exiles, elites, middle-class and poor, mainly Muslims, also Christians, Arabs, Kurds, Turkmen, intellectuals, working class, young and old, and just about everything in between. What unites most of them, but not all, is a loathing of or merely a fear of the Syrian regime and a desire for change. We might speak of three major categories of displaced Syrians in Istanbul, those who are establishing a life there with the aim of one day returning to Syria, those establishing lives without any hope or expectation of a return, and those, often the majority of the young, who are in transit to Europe, or at least hope to be so. The situation is similar in many other parts of Turkey, but I don't want to offer any sort of um, generalizations because of the great differences. The Syrians I interviewed were mainly musicians known to me from my earlier research in Aleppo, as well as their families, uh, their circles of acquaintances, including young musicians from the provinces of Aleppo, Idlib, Hums, Damascus, and Hauran, and many other areas of the country. Many reside in the Sultan Ghazi neighborhood to the north, where are we? There we go, Sultan Ghazi, to the north and east of the city center on the European side, right up there you can see it. Um, a good hour from the city center by tramway or bus. A few reside a little bit closer to downtown, and some had family um, and friends in distant neighborhoods on the Asian side of the Bosphorus. Sultan Ghazi is a working class neighborhood that today hosts a large Syrian population, one estimate is about 20,000, who are attracted by relatively um, lower, if increasingly expensive rents, about three or $400 a month, access to transportation, some limited availability of employment, inexpensive shops that sell familiar foodstuffs, a large mosque, and an existing network of Syrians and social support services for Syrian families, including a private school run by a Taiwanese charity that educates several hundred children. The majority of the Syrians I met had left Syria in late 2013 or 2014. 
relatively recently, especially after the barrel bombs began to fall with frequency in Aleppo. Some had arrived very recently, within a month of my coming to Istanbul. Some came with their families, but the majority of the young men came alone or with brothers and cousins, leaving their parents and sisters behind, in some cases to care for elderly relatives, in other cases because they lived in relative safety and comfort. And I mention this because it's important to note that not all Syrians suffer the consequences of the war equally. And in fact, many get by in places we have come to know as devastated, such as Homs, Aleppo, and Idlib. The Syrian artists I interviewed ranged in ages from 17 to 60, with most of the young artists in their early 20s and unmarried, and the older ones mainly in their 50s and married with children and grandchildren at home. In a reversal of the domestic economy in Syria, sons supported fathers, and daughters often took on light work in order to bring in extra income, since many of the older men either could not work due to health problems, insufficient Turkish language skills, lack of experience, and, for most, a lack of sufficient funds to finance small business ventures as many Syrians have done elsewhere in Turkey. Only one of the younger musicians earned his living primarily for music, performing three nights a week in a Syrian restaurant downtown. Others had day jobs in textile or shoe manufacturing, often basement sweatshops in the neighborhood, um, some in markets owned by friends and relations, or in agriculture food processing, alongside migrant workers from as far as Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and China. Many complained of discrimination against Syrian workers and often demoralizing working conditions. Several had formed musical ensembles that perform on the street, mainly in the early evenings along the Istiklal Jadisi. Um, there you see some, some of them. Um, the main drag in the Beolu Tuxim district, and for social occasions such as engagements and wedding parties, and even concerts at local cultural centers um, and establishments such as the Syrian run Pages Bookshop. Many of you may have read about that. Some also performed on the Bosphorus boat cruises during Ramadan, which is quite fun. Uh, during my time in Istanbul, I collected their stories of life in war-torn Syria, as well as their narratives of coming to Turkey um, and how they had adjusted to life. And what follows, I discuss just one set of stories concerning a family of Syrian musicians who came to Turkey from Aleppo in the last two years. Their responses to displacement, rich and full of contradictions, evoke some of the contradictions faced by many Syrian immigrants in Istanbul, how to reconcile memories of home with the exigencies of a new homeland. Um, give you a sense of what these guys sound like. Oh, that didn't work. I guess that video is off. Anyway. Um, so I first met Abu Karim in 1996 at a concert at the Aleppo Citadel, where he was performing with the musical ensemble that he managed. In addition, he also ran his family's home decoration business. The father of two sons and a daughter, he lived a modest, if comfortable life, immersed in family, community, and faith and the cultural traditions, traditions that have made Aleppo world, uh, famous worldwide, its music and its cuisine. And Abu Karim is an expert in both fields and can discuss with gusto the finer points of vocal ornamentation and, mic and spice mixes. His home was situated on a promontory overlooking the old city of Aleppo, a few hundred yards from the radio station. In mid-2013, the station and its environment was subject to fierce fighting from all sides, and as a result, the area sustained significant damage. I had not heard from or about Abu Karim for some months. Nobody had. While there was little news coming from Aleppo, a proud city laid low with power outages, no water, and diminishing food and other resources. In fall 2014, I was surprised by a friend request on Facebook from none other than Abu Karim, writing from Istanbul. So I flew there to see him and his family the following summer. As we strolled around the wharf at Eminonu, we, walked, we talked about his voyage from Aleppo. His home had indeed been damaged in the battle for the radio station. The house being uninhabitable, they fled down the hill to relative safety with, rel with relatives down the hill where they remained for several weeks until the battle for the radio station had quieted down. Then they warily returned home to see what they could salvage. Like many Syrians, they kept cash and jewelry and other valuables at home, and these had been looted. All that remained were some odds and ends, clothing and a few valuable items, two older model cars and some appliances. Hoping to remain in Aleppo, like many thinking that the conflict would be over soon, they sold what they could of their possessions to afford basic supplies, increasingly expensive. When this ran out, they decided to flee to Turkey. To do so required bribes at checkpoints, numerous taxi, minibus, and bus rides, and a lot of walking. The journey would be long and difficult, and as a result, Abu Karim, who had suffered a stroke during this time, um, only took with him what he described as his essentials, two suitcases, one with clothing and one with his spices. He said he could not live anywhere in the world without his Aleppo spices. Imagine, soured, he said, when we moved to Istanbul, I found a shop around the corner with the same spices. Still, my spices are better because they're from Aleppo. 
He invited me to his home to enjoy a Ramadan iftar. That was the season. Before dinner, we strolled through his new neighborhood. Sultan Ghazi reminded me of many similar districts in Damascus and Aleppo, four to six story buildings of recent construction, a bit remote from the city center, but with many small shops and cafes and a few restaurants. Sultan Ghazi is a bit shabby, and the streets a little dusty compared to those of the downtown neighborhoods. That's because of the Kurds, said Abu Karim when I pointed this out. They're unclean. I pressed him about what he meant and whether they were Turkish or Syrian Kurds he was referring to. Ah, they're all the same. They're dirty people and cause problems, like in Syria. They're thieves and you can't trust them. I was a little bit surprised not only by the remark, but because Abu Karim had been known to be generous in his relations with all peoples in Aleppo, including our mutual Kurdish friends. They have Alawis here too, the Alevis. Bad people, say in. Actually, the Turkish Alawis are worse, Ahgarim and the Syrians. He went on and on to extol the AKP, the majoritarian Turkish Justice and Development Party, and uh, Erdogan's leadership. He's built and developed modern Turkey. Everything you see here, the tramway, the metro, the parks, Erdogan did it. In his Facebook post, Abu Karim had often ruminated on lessons that Syrians could learn from the Turks. Development and public comportment and hygiene were among his favorite posts. Now he added ethnicity and religion to the mix. Even Sufism, inspiration for much of the poetry that he actually sang in Aleppo, was not spared his newly critical gaze. He claimed it to be heterodox, bidah, foreign, not Islamic, dekhil al-Islam, and even dangerous, khatir, because it leads people to worship humans, the awliya, and not the prophet. He dismissed the oft-repeated repeated claim that Sufism is an antidote to jihadism. Uh, they're all both the same. Both of them are extreme. It was a uh, radical change of discourse for a man who had proudly accompanied me to the Maluia Mosque in Aleppo, which, like the Galata uh, Medlevihanasi, named after Rumi, whose musical preferences included works composed, performed, and inspired by Armenians, Kurds, Turks, Arabs, Jews, and others. We walked a bit more than came to his home in time for the iftar. After greeting the extended family, 12 of them living in a, an apartment, and we, went, uh, we sat down for dinner. The table was set with a plethora of dishes, the most savory foods from Aleppo, and some Turkish foods as well, such as kshikofta, sort of vegetarian raw kibbe. And they had to get rid of the meat because of sanitation problems. It was delicious, though, um, when I mentioned the similarity of Aleppo and Ottoman dishes. Many, in fact, are Ottoman dishes with Ottoman names. Abu Karim's wife, Abu Karim, said, Yani, they get it all from us. All this is from Aleppo, except the chikufta, since the raw kibbe is not allowed anymore. And Abu Karim agreed, yeah, who are these Turks anyway? They got their civilization from us. I was too busy to enjoying the food to really comment on the contradictions. But afterwards, we settled down on the sofa and spoke of music. Aha, a topic that we can agree on. A nephew came by with his kanun, and the zither that they like to play, and began to, to perform. Abu Karim broke out in a layali, followed by a mawal, then a qasida, genres that many of you are familiar with. <clears throat> the family slowly gathered from the kitchen in the upper floor. They rent a duplex, uh, broad smiles on their faces. I was overjoyed to hear an old friend sing, even if his voice had was a little bit strained because he had had the stroke and some other problems there. Um, uh, the last number was a song about welcoming guests, and I felt honored to be there. When he finished, I clapped him on the back and we hugged. His youngest son, now 18, looked on with a somewhat shocked expression, while the eldest, Karim, stood at the door cradling the young, his young daughter. Abu Karim apologized for his weak voice. Then his son said, you know, this is the first time that Baba has sung at home since we've come to Istanbul. I was more than a little surprised. They had been there for over a year. We're a family of vocalists and well-known musicians from Aleppo, leaders of the most distinctive um, ensemble from Aleppo. And yet, he had not sung a single time at home. Why, I asked. Abu Karim shrugged his shoulders, looked down in his lap, in his hands, in his lap, and exhaled, yeah, Abu Nadim, my name, he said to me, it's too painful. I haven't felt moved to sing since coming from Aleppo. The youngest son joined in to say, yeah, we feel sad, huzen, when we hear the music on TV or the internet, so we turn it off. It's just too much. I turned to the nephew in his kanun. <clears throat> he said, I don't sing, he joked, raising his hands. I just play. But seriously, for me, it's too hard also. But music is my life. I have to play. And I'm still learning and play whenever I get the opportunity to. When I asked him with whom he performs and plays, he mentions a group of friends, some of whom you see on the screen today, uh, not all of them from Aleppo, but many who get together from time to time, and some have actually formed musical groups that were in the previous slide that play on the streets. Um, and they struggle to learn this repertoire that has been so famous. Um, so a few weeks into my trip, Abu Karim hosted a sahara, or evening gathering, at his home. I'd asked him to invite some other Syrian friends and families, but he said they only really knew about five families from Aleppo and didn't really get around much, um, one of them being his brother, who's also in the picture here. <clears throat> 
despite living in a neighborhood with extensive connections with other Syrians, they lived almost entirely in isolation. His nephew, the Kanun player, came over with a number of his musician friends, two oud players, uh, a violinist, three vocalists. They ranged in age from 17 to 30. Only two had attended the conservatory. The others had either not finished their course of study or not studied at a conservatory at all. Most had, had had a decent basis in the traditional music of Aleppo, but also Egyptian song and increasingly Turkish popular music. In at least two cases, some of the well-known musical families from Aleppo and from Aleppo and Idlib, they seemed to carry the burden of tradition on their shoulders without yet having the strength and training or experience to do so. They also seemed a bit cowed by the expertise and, in fact, the arrogance of the conservatory trained musicians. This marked another reversal from Syria, where none of the top performers of the traditional music had attended the main conservatories in Aleppo or, or Damascus, but instead had been trained either informally through family members, or in the various social musical clubs like the Nadi Shibab al-Uruba in Aleppo, the most prominent, or through attendance at classes at the professional syndicate. The conservatory was not in the least bit authentic in Syria. However, in Turkey, these graduates had a certain credibility that the younger non-trained performers lacked. It may also mark their immersion in a Turkish music market where formal standardized training is expected of professional musicians. So led by the Kanun player and more experienced Oudman, they played for a few hours while we sang, chatted, drank tea, discussed the music and its history. Abu Karim's brother was lecturing to one of the young vocalists about the origins of the music, especially the Moshahat. And given that I had just published a book on the topic, he asked me to confirm the Arab origins of the song that they were performing in an effort to instruct the younger artist. Such discussions are typical at Sahara's in Aleppo or at any evening at one of the clubs where the music is performed. Of course, the relationships between Turkish, Ottoman, and Syrian so-called Arab music are very well documented. Most of the songs performed in 20th century Syria dip into a deep well of shared musical inspiration with Ottoman, Persian, Central Asian, Arabian, and various European sources. Though many of them were in fact composed only in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and sometimes as recently as the 1960s and 70s. In Aleppo, many of the prominent composers, performers, and instrument makers had been members of religious and ethnic minorities, Jews, Christians, Kurds, Armenians, Turkmen, Gypsies, or Noah al Raja, and others. This is well known and well documented in numerous studies in many languages. However, by the end of the Sahara, Abu Karim and his brother were presenting an Arab and Muslim and Sunni Muslim-centered idea of their tradition, downplaying the non-Arab and non-Muslim dimensions of the music as inconsequential, ghair muhim, or weak, ta'if. 20 years earlier, they had sung a different tune, one that celebrated Syria's and especially Aleppo's cultural diversity in the old-fashioned mosaic model of Syrian society that we've already heard about. I'd like to have a little bit of a listen to these guys. <laughs> A little bit about nostalgia and tradition. So how might we understand this admittedly brief example of narratives of home, belonging, and displacement? There are, of course, some clear generational differences <clears throat> in how Syrians articulate their experiences of displacement in Istanbul. On the one hand, the older Syrians I spoke with were, for the most part, consigned to waiting for change to occur in their homeland and doing their best to survive and adapt in a new land. The comfort of a shared culture, but the challenges of a new language made the adjustment complicated for older Syrians. And as a result, they had few contact with Turks and lived in relative isolation from other Syrians. The latter was due in part to suspicions of political allegiances, the inability to travel widely in the city due to health or financial limitations, and a focus on managing growing families in small spaces. As I mentioned, one result of their experience of war in Syria and their displacement has tended to be a hardening of lines of communal distinction and a reification of their culture, which they now understood as more purely Arab, Aleppo, or Islamic than was the case when I knew them in Syria. For these older Syrians in, Aleppo, in Istanbul, the older mosaic model of Syrian culture, in which diversity was not only acknowledged but celebrated, was replaced by discourses of cultural purity and contamination. The younger ones, on the other hand, mobilized their talents not only to eke out a living, often working exhausting hours with little rest, but to plan for a new life, 
Some had married and even started families in Istanbul, though I should note that one man expressed an interest in marrying off his second daughter because she was too expensive, quote unquote, to keep at home. And we need to acknowledge the various pressures that the community faces. Whereas older Syrians had an eye and an ear on their homes with frequent communication with family and friends in Aleppo via social media, and often thought of returning, the younger ones, however, planned a new life in Istanbul with an eye not so much on Syria, but on Europe. As an example, I had an appointment for coffee with a young musician I'd met that we had set for my return from a quick trip to Egypt. <clears throat> however, by the time I had returned to Istanbul, he had already fled to Austria, having taken one of those infamous rubber diggies across to Greece and then making his way mainly by foot to Austria where he had settled a, in a camp. Today, he lives outside of Vienna with a Greek and Syrian housemates uh, with whom he plays music. It is not an uncommon story, and in fact, many young Syrians I met could recite the daily smuggler tariffs for getting to Europe. Like a commodity market dealing, of course, in human misery and hope, the rates rose or fell according to meteorological and political conditions. Waiting and planning seem to be the uh, major occupation for many young Syrians in Istanbul. A few other points, I'll just, for the sake of brevity, go through them quickly. Um, uh, the older musicians lived lives almost devoid of music, which was surprising to me, whereas the younger ones um, engaged in music partly out of a sense of, of engaging in their tradition, but also to make money, and they earned uh, livelihoods on the street uh, in many instances doing that. Um, one way I've begun to think about this is, uh, these contradictions is through the concept of nostalgia or nostalgic dwelling. Following Svetlana Boim, I understand nostalgia to be a quintessentially modern phenomenon uh, rather than a traditional archaic form of wistful remembrance. And to conflate nostalgia with longing would be a mistake in her view. She distinguishes a number of varieties of nostalgia, restorative and reflective, the former emphasizing the home, the nostos, in attempts to reconstruct it, um, whereas the latter emphasizing the algia or the pain of longing and deferring a return home in lieu of a more ironic attachment to the lost past. In addition, um, these, uh, the restorative nostalgia tends to reappear not as nostalgia per se, but as tradition or heritage. Whereas reflective nostalgia does not call for any sort of return of lost truths, eschews any sense of heritage and revival, and embraces ambivalence and contradiction, much like the younger performers. The older ones express a sort of restorative nostalgia in many ways, although oddly enough, if they use the word hurba to discuss a sense of homesickness, they almost never use the more positive word of hanin or longing, a sort of yearning, um, which in my earlier work I discussed as a much more positive attachment tradition. There it was just like pain, elam, and we just can't listen to the music. It's too painful. Um, uh, for this reason, the young musicians were much more actively engaged in refining their tradition um, and creating hybrid genres, often with Turkish, Greek, and Iranian musicians who found themselves in Istanbul. Um, so broadening their potential, potential economic base, but also allowing innovation and change within the tradition itself, alleviating some of those burdens that I mentioned earlier. It also goes without saying that all of my informants, with a few exceptions, were men, so there's a clear gender bias in this. It would be important to learn how uh, women deal with these same contradictions. And there are no public female performers, um, of Syrian uh, women performers in Istanbul, and uh, almost none, uh, even historically in Syria, other than vocalists. Uh, and there are clear social status and economic class differences that we can discuss in our uh, question and answer. Um, I've, discuss mainly the music, the culinary um, performances are equally interesting and something I'll be pursuing in future research. Um, but both the musical and culinary performances, as I call them, are ways of reimagining home and at the same time are critical statements about Syria um, and their positions of uh, displacement, their conditions of displacement today. A lot of work remains, and in future trips, I hope uh, to gather more material on musical performance and listening, for example, playlists and collaborations among Syrian and non-Syrian artists. I started to gather those, but also attend more to culinary performances, such as food presented at Sahara's, as well as the recipes most frequently preferred or prepared on a daily basis. And my original plan was to compare communities in Istanbul with those in Gaziantep. Uh, but due to a deteriorating security situation uh, during the south of Turkey, in the south of Turkey during my research period, uh, I had to postpone that portion of the research. So my hope is that a focus on the ways Syrian communities in these um, Syrians in these two communities of Istanbul and Gaziantep use expressive culture to refashion their lives can help shed light on the dynamics of cultural change, but also highlight the agency and not only victimhood of these creative and resilient people. And with that, I will say thank you. I want to start with a statement recently collected 
a kind of a testimony collected by uh, Doctors Without Borders in a, in a Serbian forest um, from a Sir Syrian man stranded with wife and a six-year-old son. After going through all this, I feel like I'm dying 60 times every day. I wonder what will my son say to me when he grows older? Why did you take me on all, with all these dangers around to make me face death a million times in one hour? Did you want to sacrifice me for your own sake? Of course I didn't. I had either to let him be slaughtered or take him in a death trip. So what I want to do with you over this half an hour is rather, I guess, ambitious. Uh, I want to give you some offer some glimpses uh, into that very resilient uh, death trip and you know where and how and the spatial and time um, constraints. Um, I also want to point out the centrality of Turkey uh, right now, uh, especially as Europe or the rest of Europe tries to grapple uh, with the so-called <coughs> crisis. And finally, I intend to share some reflections on our work as social scientists uh, or in the humanities. So, well, probably we all know that, that Syrians, uh, even within Syria, need facilitators, smugglers, to, to move around within the country and to facilitate their transit or exit uh, out of the country, including uh, you know, to all the re uh, neighboring countries. Um, routes are kind of old and, you know, it used to be smuggler routes for uh, petrol and cigarettes and now it's, it's humans, uh, persons. Um, you know, every kind of soldier and every kind of, uh, kind of military formation uh, asks for, for money, for, you know, at kind of every stage of the way uh, when not sex. Um, there's sometimes groups traveling together um, by car, but you know, they give you a ride, uh, it's not free. Uh, it could be anywhere between 80 and $1,000 to just get you to the border with um, Turkey. Some, some Syrians um, happens to be, uh, especially Palestinians, fly to Sudan and then all the way um, to Libya and then to Italy. Uh, but I want to, of course, focus on the uh, Aegean, you know, Turkey to Greece uh, route. I also want to briefly point out that there is nothing, uh, you know, kind of a deterministic or nothing only geographical about this route. So, in other words, um, over the last few years, it, it became essentially impossible for Syrians to travel to um, Algeria. Libya and uh, Egypt, uh, Algeria and Egypt because of visa requirements over the last couple of years, uh, Libya because of the whole uh, situation uh, there. And, um, and also Syrians are, well, became really aware of the lethal, deadly nature of the so-called central Mediterranean passage between, again, Libya and Egypt and, um, and Italy. So um, um, this is the core of my research, the kind of maritime passage. And I do want to point out that uh, 2015 was the so-called deadliest year on record. Uh, and I, I, I feel like I, I don't want to share the numbers. I, I have you know, some issues with trivializing these numbers right now. But, uh, you know, the, uh, we use the exact same phrase, uh, you know, the deadliest year on record in 2014 and in 2011. And I've been kind of following this and being on top of this for the last you know, decade or so. So I'm not um, too happy or too, you know, optimistic um, about this. So, um, so there is a lot of discussion about Turkey and, you know, it was in the news uh, a week ago, people kind of stranded on the Syrian side, uh, close to Aleppo and 
Um, you know, the, the huge number, of course, of Syrians already uh, in Turkey, which is again around to at least two point uh, two and a half million. Uh, in reality, the border with between Syria and Turkey, or rather from the Turkish side, is not really open. It's never open uh, in early March 2015, uh, or since March of last year, so it's been a year, the border on the Turkish side is open to aid trucks, to traders, to injured people, Syrians, to Syrians who are already registered in Turkey and are given a special permission to visit Syria. So it is really common knowledge among Syrians, um, especially since the latest, uh, you know, kind of wave of terrorist events or attacks within Turkey, that Turkey can be entered only using smugglers. And even using smugglers, the kind of only route right now is the one close to uh, Antakya because of the hilly terrain, which makes it difficult for the police forces uh, in Turkey. Um, there, there have been reports, you know, Human Rights uh, Amnesty, uh, Human Rights Watch, kind of collecting testimonies of um, detention overnight on Turkish soil, uh, hundreds of people forcibly returned to Syria, uh, beatings by board, Turkish border guards, uh, and also Turkey introduced a requirement right now in January uh, that Syrians coming from third states such as Jordan and Lebanon must have a visa to enter the country. In the meantime, since last October and then November, and then it was kind of ratified right now, three billion euros have been committed by the European Union purportedly toward improving the situation of Syrian refugees registered in Turkish camps. But only 10% um, only of the Syrians are actually living in those camps. And so the vast majority, 90% or so, live outside government-run refugee camps. And so, you know, uh, it's an open-ended question, okay, the, the, those three billion, assuming, you know, they, they reach Syrian refugees, you know, which Syrian refugees and how many and, and all of that. Uh, also, I do want to say that during 2015, the Turkish government improved access to education and healthcare for Syrian refugees. But since September, we are also witnessing, we're seeing more detention of people trying to cross to the EU. And it's detention up to two months, uh, ostensibly arbitrary. And it's, you know, detention a thousand kilometers or 600 miles uh, to the east of, you know, the kind of more European part of Turkey or Anatolia. Um, and, uh, you know, I may record it. So allegedly uh, there, there has been torture um, in, and there is the testimony while in detention, while in arbitrary detention um, by, uh, you know, testimony by a 40 year old Syrian um, at one of the removal centers. And quite interestingly, upon being released uh, from this det detention center, he brought with him, this guy brought with him a label he found on, the equip on some equipment uh, of the facility, mattresses or a bed or something. And the label says EU, European Union contribution, 85%. So, you know, uh, Europe paid for, for that detention center and it dates back to 2013. So uh, there are additional reception, reception, which is detention centers being planned and built, and this has been going on for many, many years. Um, you know, in one facility, um, of, you know, personnel said, you know, this is humanitarian detention. It's like these are beggars. These are people who really wouldn't have any other place, you know, where to sleep. So we're not detaining them. It's, you know, humanitarian. I've seen, you know, again, I've seen this kind of argument and discourse over the last 10, 10 years, and it's kind of becoming um, dominant. Um, and a lot of people are, you know, um, signing their voluntary returns uh, to Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan. And, you know, we can talk about the voluntary nature there. Um, just briefly, there is a, an important number of Syrian refugees who work illegally in Turkey and obviously making them vulnerable to abuse. Uh, again, re very recently, the Turkish government uh, kind of passed new legislation allowing Syrian refugees to work 
but it's only a tiny minority and there are a lot of you know, minor qualifications. So what I'm saying is that the vast majority of Syrians find themselves uh, working informally and, and you know, being exploited. Um, also, very briefly, one needs to keep in mind the larger issue to which Jonathan kind of hinted of uh, child and informal labor uh, in Turkey. Uh, you know, a report from 2012 estimated that there were uh, one and a half million informal workers in the garment and leather industries compared to just uh, half a million registered workers. So, you know, it's a huge workforce and much of it is informal. And there are about uh, almost half a million, 400,000 Syrian children who are not in school in Turkey. In some cases, you know, they've been out of school since the beginning of the war. Uh, many are working informally, uh, learning Turkish and, as you said, supporting their families. Now, the kind of bulk of what I want to say about this, uh, between January and October 2015, the Turkish Coast Guard intercepted some 60,000 people in the Aegean, actively preventing them from reaching Greek islands. Still, many people want Turkey to do more, uh, including Frontex, which is the EU uh, border patrol agency, a variety of European officials and think tanks, uh, and even the liberal newspaper, uh, German um, Der Spiegel. And I, as I explain in, in my book, uh, there's a fundamental empirical fault in the abstract expectation that Turkish or Greek, Egyptian, Libyan, Tunisian, Italian maritime patrols can somehow safely, humanely, and without the use of force deter, dissuade, or reroute uh, Europe-bound migrant boats or boats. Uh, so, you know, even, okay, let's forget about the ethical aspect. There is a, you know, a military logistical difficulty. I mean, you can sink boats, I document that. You can damage boats, uh, you can use force. So, I mean, you can do that, but there is that kind of price. And, and yet, we hear paradigmatically that, quoting, it is a myth that the Greek-Turkish border can't be protected, as the Greek Navy has sufficient capacity to keep refugees out. And this was, it, again, just an example, not picking on this person, but it's the interior minister of Austria. And, um, and yeah, as I said, even the Spiegel and even a lot of so-called liberal newspapers and magazines are essentially you know, pointing their finger at Turkey for not doing enough at sea, not only closing the borders um, on land. And um, I should mention also that, um, you know, this idea, and quoting somebody else, uh, Frontex, that Turkey has to make it more difficult for the migrant smugglers um, has been taken up lately by NATO, uh, North Atlantic treaty, whatever, organization, uh, you know, military. So we, we see uh, this, what they call a military humanitarian kind of nexus uh, emerging once again. Um, and uh, essentially uh, Navy military patrols, uh, you know, monitoring the Aegean supposedly or sensibly to um, identify smugglers, you know, do intelligence work, but also, again, there's the humanitarian component of, you know, rescuing people and, and all of that, which, again, I document, I document in, in my book. Uh, I do want also to mention that, you know, in 2015, Turkish police arrested more than 300 smugglers, which was, you know, much more than they did in the past. And pretty obviously, fundamental point, uh, Turkey, patrols heavily its land borders with Greece and Bulgaria. And so, uh, you know, once again, why, why, you know, Turkey has a European, you know, kind of uh, territory, again, close to, you know, neighboring Bulgaria and, and Greece. So why people don't just travel there and instead, you know, go through the sea? Well, uh, there, again, it's not just geography, it's politics and it's border enforcement. And by the way, it's, it's also obvious that there are a lot of geopolitics in what Turkey and the Turkish, 
Turkish government do and when they do things and what they say and you know when they say things and um, pre pre Erdogan recently stated well actually cyclically you know we are not idiots and you know we're not idiots if we want we can just put people on on buses or or would you rather have us you know kill them kill these Syrian refugees that's the kind of language he's using uh, based on some um, transcriptions of his both political meetings at the EU level and kind of you know public speaking within within Turkey I guess so well leaving behind all of these evidently at a great human and financial cost between January and December of last year uh, as you know as an estimated 1 million people arrived in Europe 84% um, came from so-called refugee producing countries uh, roughly half from Syria, then Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, one quarter of these one million uh, were child or minor children, minors. Um, this year, only you know, 2016, some 60,000 people have crossed into Greece. Again, about half of them Syrians, uh, about one quarter again children. And this year, there have been. Um, some 400 people dying or missing at sea, in, mostly in the Aegean, but also again between Libya uh, and Italy. And, you know, they, all these people, especially the ones dying, but also the ones kind of suffering uh, throughout, or, well, I don't like suffering. Uh, the ones being the object of structural violence, and you know, I don't have time to make this argument, but again, in my larger work, I do argue that this is uh, violence. So you know, you could argue that they left behind the prospect of war, or the evidence, or the you know, experience of war, to face what I call empirical offenses of structural injustice, uh, crimes of peace, which is also the title of my work. So you know, it's not. Uh, this is empirical, this can be documented. There is cause and effect, there is correlation, there is a, a history. Uh, there are, you know, concatenations that I think, again, I, I, you know, we can prove and as social scientists talk about. So, um, now, in a forthcoming article, by the way, uh, you know, I do ask, well, The sea does nothing by itself, right? The sea, the Mediterranean, which probably you know we all love, uh, the sea does not enforce um, borders. The sea does not deport people. The sea does not sign bilateral agreements. Uh, the sea does not rescue people. The sea does not traffic in people. So again, there's something more going on, uh, I believe. And again, which I call crime, crimes of peace. And as I was saying in a forthcoming article, I do ask, you know, what kind of mourning do crimes of peace engender, if any? So can there be public mourning when, I'm quoting, the great achievement of liberal capitalism, which is the separation of crime from the state, and it, that's Cohen on structural violence, kind of state violence. So, you know, the great achievement, ostensibly, of liberal democracy, of liberal capitalism, the separation of crime from the state is challenged by responsibilities that are located not at sea or with smugglers and scrupulousness, but what I believe at the heart of liberal democracy. For it is obvious that in addition to specific situations they leave behind in countries of origin, including Syria as a whole, many people have become in need of protection because of the exploitation, trauma and violence during their journey, including on Greek islands, um, Kos. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit, but you know, what's going on at every single border uh, in southeastern Europe, um, as to, well, first of all, the Turkish borders, but then Macedonia and Greece, Macedonia and uh, Serbia, Serbia and Croatia, Hungary, most famously or infamously. Uh, you know, it's a succession of fancies. And this is um, plan B. This is Europe's plan B. I'll get to plan A as well. Plan B right now being discussed is and for like fencing the border 
between Macedonia, which is not even part of the European Union, uh, Macedonia and Greece. So essentially leaving refugees kind of to their own devices or you know, at the mercy of the Greek and Turkish governments um, indefinitely and, you know, and, and that's it, sealing the border um, between Macedonia and Greece. At the border between Macedonia and Greece, you know, we saw recently in past November people suing their lips shut, um, non-Syrians, because you know this is relevant and related so much to the to Syrians in that everyone, you know, says he or she is Syrian or has real or forged documents, and. Obviously, when you are you know, in Germany and the government is processing a million asylum requests or that kind of thing, you know, uh, whatever you're coming from about this, but you know, uh, there, it's more work. So anyway, a lot of people who are not Syrian feel that they have to say that they're Syrian or you know, otherwise they are going to be stranded. So plan A, uh, which does not really exclude plan B, plan A, is for Turkey being or becoming uh, a safe country. Everyone landing, arriving in Greece from Turkey being essentially deported uh, back in Turkey since it's a safe country. Um, and a co so-called coalition of the willing uh, led by Germany uh, and the Netherlands, so a coalition of the willing proactively resettling, ideally, 250,000 people on a yearly basis every year from Turkey. So in exchange for that resettlement, Turkey will, again, keep everyone in, you know, miraculously fence all the borders and Greece also, you know, fence the Aegean um, and, and, and that kind of thing. And I'm, you know, I'm happy to address, okay, in theory, what would happen if, you know, this plan A came to be. But, you know, Turkish Prime Minister Davatoglu uh, has been reported stating, uh, you know, my country is not a concentration camp and will not host refugees, will not host refugees indefinitely. You know, we're not a concentration camp. Same things were said, you know, over the last few years in Greece, in Italy, in yeah. Serbia, you know, we're not a concentration camp. And so the, the question that I want to kind of posit is to a degree, um, well, you know, again, I, I've studied the, the how. How is the inequality in the kind of distribution or better responsibility for refugees is reinforced? You know, how? how? physically, materially, uh, politically, you enforce this system of 2.5 million in Turkey, one, more than 1 million in you know, tiny Lebanon, and 1 million in Europe. And you know, we can talk about the US too. That's not just uh, natural, it's, it's actively enforced. So, no, how, but also why? What are the explanations or what are the justifications for perpetuating this inequality in the global responsibility for refugees, right? Why does it have to be this way? And, you know, right-wing political actors, you know, there's a long list in Europe, uh, but right-wing political actors have, you know, their own explanations. It's about welfare, it's about Islam, like we are Islamophobic, it's about, um, you know, unemployment, it's about security, it's about our ostensibly Christian nature in, in Europe or, you know, the US. So, okay, that's the, the right wing. How about, you know, the more liberal, progressive, kind of centrist political leaders? What kind of explanations do they give for this you know, imbalance, inequality in the global responsibility for refugees. Silence, there is silence. Uh, there are no explanations. And you know, one hypothesis is that Eurocentrism you know, doesn't even need explanations. We just take it for granted, we as a European, you know, we just take it for granted that this is the way it works. This is natural, this is normal, that you know, Lebanon, you know, I've heard, oh, they're culturally similar. Sure, you know, uh, there's so much sim 
simplistic take on again, as we were saying this morning, you know what the Middle East means, what you know what culture, what religion uh, mean. So I will will not you know uh, kind of list uh, possible kind of solutions or or ways to mitigate the loss of life at, at sea, which is my priority, uh, and we can do that later. But there are you know there are things that can be done, but are not happening. Um, but I do want to spend, you know, a couple of minutes or five minutes on, on um, you know, kind of our role. It sounds presumptuous again, but and it is, you know, as social scientists or anthropologists or you know, people in the humanities. And well, we we, you know, we we, we do come across with, um, we, you know, we we kind of stay honest and, and close to our existence and to that of our you know, research participants, um, critically, but also honestly. And I, such consciously relational perspective challenges the ostensible straitjackets of representativeness and of biased, native and naive anthropology, uh, all occasionally deployed to dismiss not ethnographic, you know, per, to a degree personal knowledge per se, but its theoretical and political import. Uh, and I want to, you know, make the case that it's really others who need to be more defensive, who need to adopt a more defensive posture, analytically and politically. Others without scare quotes, actually, but also without you know, lingering too much over our tentative provisional kind of self-exemption. I'm thinking of those commentators who casually embrace the realist fetish of sovereign legality at all costs and equate unauthorized mobility with a sacrilegious rupture. I'm thinking of those who fail to expose their transcendent knowledge to grounded and drowned existences those who think that the difference between economic and forced migrants is naturally given, thus allowing the summary repatriation for certain nationalities, Nigeria, Morocco, Pakistan, Egypt, T Tunisia, and kind of forcing a lot of other people of you know, declaring Syrian nationality. I'm, you know, I'm thinking these others, those who waiving aggregate data and disembodied refugee quotas use the strong language of statistics to pontificate about the need to transcend the solidarity of coastal residents in Libya, in Italy, in Greece, in Turkey, um, to transcend the voice of refugees and to transcend you know, refugees' embodiment of structural injustice. Those who, by providing simplistic accounts of global migrations, are in turn able to purport simplistic solutions. And, you know, ideally, it's about time for the supporters of the global ideology or regime of refugee containment, which is what we are seeing, refugee containment, to explain and justify, if they can, substantial preemption of the right of asylum, costly detention, socially disruptive removal, skyrocketing spending on border militarization. It costs, you know, a billion dollar plus the three billion to Turkey, you know, a year to just do some surveillance in all European borders. Implausible low labor quotas, which is really important, that's at the border. And ultimately the impossibility for most, impo especially impoverished and vulnerable people, including Syrians, to legally reunite with families already in Europe or here, seek work and find a responsible jurisdiction in a place other uh, than the place where they were born. Now, all of these questions, you know, that I'm positing and that I should, you know, make people assume a defensive posture are a bit maybe naive because I'm taking for granted that, you know, we are within liberal democracies and that, you know, in a liberal democracy, you need to, to kind of justify what you stand for and, you know, the death you're causing and, and all that. But, all to, but, you know, lately, I think, uh, you know, if you think about Hungary or even right now Slovenia, you know, they don't want, they don't consider themselves liberal democracies. They want to go beyond liberal democracy kind of from the right. And, you, you know, you can hear casual statements about refugees alongside casual statements uh, about, you know, defending family values. And so it is for them kind of one and the same battle, you know, Christianity, family, refugees, uh, like keeping them out. Um, I want to conclude, uh, I do have one minute, 
with um, just stating the obvious, which is that um, decision makers and influential observers routinely discount the words and aspirations expressed by refugees and irregular migrants. And you know their concerns, their voices, their demands are marginalized as largely irrelevant to the world of diplomacy, international relations, and budgetary constraints. But what are the normative political implications of the voices and experiences of these half a million Syrians who have faced death a million times each? I'm Syrian. Why aren't we allowed on planes again? Why, you know, not on ferries? Uh, let us through or kill us now. Or, you know, suing one's lips. It's also saying something. Why can't we stay in a hotel? Why, why are you putting us on shelter? I mean, we have money. You know, I have, I've also heard that. So, you know, what, how would the world and policy and human rights look like if, you know, decision makers, human rights activists, and social scientists or scholars were actually to come to their conclusions on the basis of you know, these things that um, these voices and experiences of the persons, of these persons who are seeking to trespass always new forms of structural injustice. And obviously we're not doing that. Thank you. Well, in this uh, talk that follows, I'll probably pose many more questions than I can answer. Oh, you can't hear? I'm sorry. I said I'll probably pose many more questions that I can answer in, in, in this talk. But um, let me start out by saying that although the Syrian crisis uh, is now cast as the major humanitarian uh, disaster of the post-World War II era, I would caution against its easy extraction from larger global and historical uh, dynamics of mass displacement. Um, this particular refugee crisis provides examples of continuity with those of the past, both <coughs> near and far. And yet in this refugee crisis, we see tremendous changes coming in both the spatial and humanitarian dimensions. And I always like to say every refugee crisis is a laboratory. Uh, for those particularly in the, the world of policy, where you experiment with what went before and you experiment with what you're going to do now. But in talking about continuity or similarities, um, whether a person is displaced you know, through conflict, through natural disasters, through um, environmental stresses, many of the experiences are similar. Trauma, uprooting, sense of vulnerability, and of course, tremendous loss, not just of livelihoods and property, but also of kin and relationships, and of a sense of security in the world, the sense of predictability. I mean, this is something that suffuses uh, all displaced people, that you don't know what is coming from one day to the next. You're really sort of suspended um, in time. So that's something that's similar for most uh, refugee crises and other forms of displacement. Different kinds of things that are arising with this refugee crisis include, for example, um, derationing. You know, this is um, the first time we've seen uh, mass derationing of um, refugees, and this marks a, quite a departure from past refugee crises. And it's been replaced by a whole host of things, vouchers and uh, ATM cards and all sorts of things. But it's just to give you a sense of, you know, the changes and yet the uh, similarities. Uh, what is new is the conscious, purposeful sort of move away from the refugee camp as a device of containment and site of humanitarian interventions to one where we're really seeing um, what has been described uh, just now by Maurizio, you know, prolonged, very harrowing flights through multiple states. Um, with varying levels of reception, of interdiction, of the granting of asylum. And then on the other hand, we are seeing refugees uh, settling into urban areas. And this the UNHCR has declared as its policy to uh, essentially abolish the refugee camp and settle refugees in urban areas. Now, 
This framework of continuity and change, I think, brings into sharper focus a few of the things I'm going to talk about today, which include mobility and immobility, uh, containment, and um, refugee creativity and resourcefulness, which I think uh, Jonathan's piece brought out so beautifully. And of course, the rethinking how aid is to be distributed. Now, you know, in the title of this conference was In and Out of Syria, and my talk was about refugees in motion. And I think what I'm uh, trying to touch on today is the way everything is in motion, aside from just refugees. The world of humanitarian aid is in flux. The spaces where refugees are to be contained uh, themselves are, are in flux. Now, refugee camps, as we know them in the Middle East, which means by and large Palestinian camps, um, and more recently the Syrian camps in Jordan, they, have, they are being superseded uh, by other spatial forms as a way to contain refugees. So the question I think those of us doing research might start posing is, what kinds of spaces are crystallizing for the displaced? Ones that are imposed on them and also ones that they themselves create. Um, on the one hand, we find uh, detention camps, uh, transit and asylum centers in Europe that serve as spatial devices and political technologies uh, to control refugee mobility. These are also deterrent uh, factors. And um, because I've been working f with refugees for a long time, I have that historical memory and I like to do comparative thinking deterrent. Uh, spaces go way back to the 70s and 80s in trying to deter uh, people from leaving um, Vietnam and come to the U.S. Deterrent camps in Hong Kong, very much set up on a military model, and the message was, don't come here. Okay? Um, now, and we see increasingly the privatization of detention centers sort of following you know, what we would loosely call a neoliberal model with ensuing miserable conditions. Uh, refugees, of course, are very eager to avoid these uh, places. They do all they can to stay out of them. And in all of these various spaces, we find a wide spectrum of decision-making capabilities and capacities among refugees, from outright refusal, uh, as we saw in Hungary, to enter uh, camps, to tremendous ingenuity and resourcefulness in creating their own makeshift temporary camps on the migratory route. And again, you know, I'm trying to put into this scenario a little bit of refugee agency uh, and creativity, uh, though I won't use the word resilient for a host of reasons. Um, and so we see refugees in these various spaces, and we also see this new phenomenon of more and more refugees scattered in urban centers. Uh, and, you know, we really have to question is what's driving the UNHCR policy on alternatives to refugee camps? Um, and what role, if any, has it played into pushing refugees uh, into urban areas and to Europe via very dangerous routes? And I'm not rooting for refugee camps. Um, I want to make that clear. It's just that these are questions that need to be asked about policy. Um, so in this uh, paper, I'm going to look at three dimensions of theory and methods in refugee studies. This is really a call for a research agenda. Um, and I'm not sure if I connect them all uh, as much as I flesh out a series of questions about possible research agendas um, on Syrian displacement, what research might look like, and what are some of the theoretical and methodological um, challenges it poses. Um, and sort of, you know, opening, I think Syrian refugees have opened the way for new sorts of thinking about uh, displacement and space and agency. So the first uh, dimension that I'm going to talk about is mobility and its centrality to conceptualizing displacement. Uh, the second dimension explores the issue of the camp and spaces of containment. And third, I probe the production of knowledge on refugees and pose a series of questions. So starting with mobility, obviously you can't think about displacement without starting with mobility. That's what displacement is. It's being compelled to, to move. And both mobility and immobility are crucial elements in the construction of the refugee in place. The refugee or the displaced person is in this funny space between forced mobility and yet immobilities, always maneuvering 
uh, within these constraints. And I guess as an anthropologist, I um, always have to remind myself and others that um, mobility, forced mobility, migration, is very much part of human history from the very beginning. Uh, from when humans spanned out across the globe to areas of the world being continuously depopulated and repopulated over millennium. And again, it's not to, um, I'm very careful about the politics of mobility that we should not um, assume that because people have moved, they can or should be moved. That is an argument that becomes very, very tricky. Um, but what I am trying to suggest is that mobility and migration have always been adaptive, adaptive responses to conflict, uh, to environmental stresses and crises, and to natural disasters. And, you know, there are conflicting accounts of the contemporary scale and scope of mobility, from claims of, oh, the world is in the state of unprecedented mobility, to others who claim that the vast majority of the world's population exists in a state of stasis, we, that we're not moving. And in the Middle East, what we are witnessing is not new historically. And I was glad in the first panel to see that going back to um, the early part of this century. And I always think about displacements regionally. Uh, and in this region, they go back, of course, to antiquity, all the way up to this most recent era when, you know, the last century and a half, we've seen Circassians, Armenians, Palestinians, Iraqis, Sudanese, Lebanese, among others who have been uh, displaced to the more recent period when we see, even before the conflict broke out in Syria, um, significant parts of uh, northeastern Syria being depopulated because of uh, drought and government mismanagement of, of drought and agricultural resources. But as has been said many times today, half the population of Syria is displaced, whether as refugees or IDPs. And um, we do need, I think, to contextualize that within <clears throat> region and history and not extract it as a unique case, even though it has its um, sort of unique contours. Okay. So now how to connect mobility to space, temporalities, and refugee resourcefulness. And this is where I think uh, it gets a little tricky. And mobilities, you know, are often perceived as very transgressive by states, by local populations, and by humanitarian uh, organizations. And, you know, just as one, you know, small example, in the uh, camps in Jordan for Syrian refugees, there are tremendous constraints on mobility within the camp itself. One thing refugees like to do when they get into a camp is they want to move their uh, housing, their shelter. They don't like to be told where to settle. And I know in Zatari camp, this became a huge issue of refugees trying to maneuver from assigned housing to some place else because they want to live with kin and friends and people from their uh, village or region. And UNHCR, Jordanian sort of police and intelligence and military, everybody wants the refugees to go exactly where you're assigned. This is the first sort of conflict that you start seeing and where mobility even within the camp is subject to uh, constraints and surveillance and interference. And of course, mobility beyond the camp varies very much uh, according to your, by camp, by legal status. Um, one could compare Zatari camp where mobility outside the camp is controlled. It, it's possible, compare it to Cyber City, which is on complete lockdown. You know, you cannot leave Cyber City, basically. And if you go in, in all of these when, camps, when you go in, you are, as a researcher, never alone. You have somebody accompanying you. Um, but Cyber City was the, the most extreme um, for this kind of surveillance. Uh, okay. So now as refugees move through space, they pass through a multitude of spatial forms and receive different levels of reception and aid, you know, from what's going on in the island of Lesbos to the Budapest train station. Um, we see that these are sites where aid is delivered, however impromptu or ad hoc, but these are fleeting temporary spaces. Sort of they have this emotionness, here today, gone tomorrow, and as, as you know, people move through them 
uh, in widely differing uh, temporal kind of um, formations. We see makeshift camps like that in uh, France, in Calais, which is a prolonged state of waiting, uh, where time operates in a different dimension. I think the temporal dimension of, of refugee uh, studies is often um, not very well understood because the displaced wait. They're in a state of prolonged waiting, whether it's for documents, for money, for asylum, for the war to be over. Um, they are in a constant state of waiting. And the spaces that refugees, these Syrian refugees, often in, they're, they're highly mediatized. Um, images, images of them circulate very widely, but these are very controlled uh, images. Um, you know, in the refugee camps, I remember in Zatari at one point, sort of humanitarian aid workers were throwing up their hands and saying, all we do is take journalists around. I mean, they were, at one point they were having, you know, several hundred journalists a day arrive by bus for the tour. It became kind of a, um, and, and you're shepherded at all times. Um, just touching on containment of mobility and getting back to some things that you said, Maurizio, about, um, you know, the EU giving $3 billion to Turkey. Um, this is sort of what I call outsourcing or externalizing your border. And it's not just in uh, Turkey. The U.S. is doing it in Mexico. The same exact thing, we're paying the Mexican police to uh, hold back refugees seeking to enter the U.S. coming from El Salvador and especially the Cubans who are coming, you know, in mass. So this kind of outsourcing uh, or externalizing of the border is, is um, you know, comparative work is really helpful here. Um, okay. So... Moving on to space, <clears throat> you know, some have called this the age of the camp. Others have cast the camp as the nomos of the century. But I think a better description of the century would be that of expulsions, forced mobility, and risk as people are on the, on the move. Now, globally, only 40% of refugees reside in camps. That still is a lot, of significant number of people. And in Jordan, only 20% of Syrians, maybe even less, are in the camps. And camps themselves are increasingly modular, confining structures. Um, if you see the camps, you know, the visuals, or you, or you visit the camps in uh, northern Jordan, uh, you know, using the pods, these are modular camps. They are like IKEA camps. You get a kit and you can set up this housing in a few hours and you can undo it just as quickly easily transportable with sort of master plans that can be um, transposed to other areas. And I think part of the new camp is the distance between refugees and humanitarian personnel. And I, I should have brought visuals with me, but the, um, the real distinction between aid and the refugees, where even the line of sight is blocked through uh, sort of barriers and interaction is blocked. Um, and of course, heavily policed. And I, because I worked in um, Palestinian camps for many, many years, very different situation, but I, I cannot always help but compare um, those camps with what we're seeing now. But in any case, I do argue that we can, or we should seek out the family resemblances between proliferating spaces of containment and forms of governance, though each Refugee case is distinct spatially, economically, in terms of governance, and of course for the experiences of those who reside in them. But containment does form a field of analysis um, bound together across time and space. And I think our task is to flesh out the theoretical and experiential uh, components of this field of analysis. And I've argued elsewhere that we really need to disaggregate this concept of the camp. The camp has come to mean everything and nothing. Uh, everything from a concentration camp in World War II to uh, transit centers. And the concept can become a little too big. Um, and I think we need to keep the concept of camp, but look for the family resemblances. And in particular, look at intent and experience. What is the intent behind a spatial device and how do people experience them? And I argue camps have life histories. We need to be writing biographies of camps. Um, because refugees take the camp and they imprint their own um, sort of uh, 
cultural and social world on them. Um, and again, that's part of the in-motionness. If we see history, of course, is always in rapid movement. And that, I think, if we give camps biographies and a history, that we can challenge this notion of bare life that has been appended to camps and go beyond it and seek the way refugees imprint the camp uh, with their own forms of community, uh, mobilities, social relationships, um, creativity, elements of creativity that take shape in the camps and give camps an identity. Camps have identities. Um, and if we do that, I think our theoretical stances might become a little more complex and intricate. Um, and I, was, I won't go too much into urban here. I was going to say a few words about urban. Uh, uh, there aren't really urban settlements because Refugees in many of these urban centers are scattered. But when I first went into Zatari camp, I remember this sort of well-known, now well-known UNHCR field coordinator, uh, Killian, everybody just knew him by his first name. I remember he declared, well, Zatari is going to be a city. And I thought, what's he talking about? Zatari is out in the middle of sort of, sort of nowhere. Um, and I didn't understand what he meant by this. and. Now I do, reading up more on UNHCR's alternative to camps, which calls for avoiding the establishment of refugee camps whenever possible. And I think it was understood this was, these are now emer supposed to be emergency devices. And five years later, of course, it's not really an emergency design, device anymore, but it is supposed to become a city anchored to the local community. And indeed, the population of this camp now at around fluctuates between 80 and 100,000, um, does raise questions of what is the urban and how do we define the urban? And when does a camp become urban? But basically the UNHCR policy uh, to dilute camps was to reduce care and maintenance. That means funding, okay? Um, but it was also accompanied by this whole lexicon, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and resilience. These are the key words, okay? That, and, and this is the, the neoliberal conceptualization of the refugee, that they can be made self-sufficient, self-sustaining, with a minimal amount of uh, care and maintenance through cost-reducing devices. Okay, I think I have, what, five minutes? This last thing on the production of knowledge, and I'll just go through this quickly. Um, I think some in refugee studies kind of got overly caught up with this notion of bare life, reading a lot of philosophy, Agamben's notion of bare life. And there's this small but significant body of literature on refugees that has a lot about Agamben, but no refugees. Okay, again, it's taking the people out of uh, the camps. Refugee camps were sort of vacated of people uh, in this quest to understand uh, bare lives. It was space with few subjects, whether they were the refugees or uh, humanitarian actors. Um, and when I looked at this literature a little more carefully, uh, there were very few references to any ethnographic uh, works on refugee camps, which do exist. They are out there. I don't think people read them. And um, I made the argument in the piece that I uh, gave to the uh, Journal of Refugee Studies when they asked us to write on camps uh, within the uh, Gambian notion of bare life. And I thought, why do we have to confine ourselves to this? It was this point of departure, and most of us wrote against it, because I think we felt at the time we just needed to move on. Um, and I said, you know, ultimately a divorce between theory and some sort of empiricism and ethnographic work just leaves us spinning our wheels. Um, and, you know, I looked at camps and spaces of containment and, and refugee sort of the spaces they create as hyper-political uh, settings and uh, atmospheres. So in any case, I suggested we gently move beyond bare life and get into ethnographies and comparative historical work, empirically grounded research to build theoretical frameworks. Um, I suggest comparison that is trans-regional, historically grounded, that highlights similarities and differences. And this way it works to de-exceptionalize particular refugee crises.
um, and locate particular histories in more expansive fields of analysis. You know, looking for parallels and distinctions, but also systemic um, processes. Again, that retaining those family resemblances. Um, and as I concluded this paper, I, you know, again, sort of made the advice that I hope we, when we look at the Syrian uh, case, we also read carefully about Iraqi refugees and Palestinian refugees and, you know, what the policy wonks even call lessons to be learned. Because much of what, I, I think, much of what informs refugee policy these days in the Middle East is that dreaded thing, which is Palestinianization. Um, you know, the long-term camp, the camp that becomes militarized, the camp that becomes a space of political organizing. And this is what the intelligence world is so eager to know and so eager to intervene in, in these camps was, um, how are they politically organizing? Who's in charge? Who's the leader of this area? And um, who are they aligned with? And what are the alliances based on? These were the questions they want to know. So they certainly see these places as hyper-political. Okay, so just to conclude, I set out a few items for research, which um, not really connected, but basically calling for as much as one can within the constraints, um, you know, ethnographic grounded field work with refugees. One thing I think that was um, problematic on Syria, uh, because I went into Zachary and the, the other camps there, and nobody had any baseline data on Syria, on who these refugees were, where they came from. And I'll give you an example. This, I thought it was kind of a silly question, but everybody was wanted to know, is early marriage happening? Okay. They were obsessed with this question. And finally, uh, I said, well, how do you know what the age of marriage was in rural communities in Syria before this? And, and you find people asking questions without having uh, baseline knowledge. I mean, it must be there somewhere, but they're more focused on the sensational uh, kinds of things. I think derationing and the public-private partnerships that are taking place around camps are, are really, really interesting. Generational differences, which we've touched on here, which I know from work with Palestinians that uh, exile, uh, forced displacement, really disrupts generational patterns of authority and, and knowledge, um, this sort of thing. And then the last question I think we're going to need to ask, among many others, is how is, re how is return envisioned? You know, what is return going to look like to, a, you know, a, a space that's it's so near complete destruction. I mean, the, the level of destruction is so phenomenal. Do people want to go back? What do they want to go back to? And the other thing is the question of um, what do you do with, um, about accountability, you know, truth and reconciliation commissions? Are you just going to have amnesia like, like Lebanon did, where you just kind of everybody go back to sort of what they're doing and nobody's held accountable? Or is there going to be that sort of reckoning? Um, so those are just some of the questions among many that I would pose. Okay. Thank you. My name is Dina Rabi, and I'm a third year PhD student in anthropology here at UT. Um, we have two panelists today. Um, our first one, Dr. Nell Gabian um, from the Department of Anthropology and Political Science in Iowa State University. Um, we'll, present, we'll be presenting a paper titled Palestinians and the War in Syria, Governmental Responses and Refugee Activism. And then after that, Skyping in with us will be Dr. Sarah Tobin from the Department of Middle East Studies at Brown University. And her paper will be titled Palestinian Refugees from Syria, the Kefela System, and New Formations of Jordanian State Power. I'd like to thank um, Sofiane and the conference organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. 
The ongoing Syrian war has exacted a tremendous toll on the country's civilian population. Among those civilians are Palestinian refugees who numbered about 560,000 prior to the war. Over two-thirds of them were internally displaced, and at least 20 percent have fled Syria. Ninety-five percent of those who are still in Syria are, re are receiving sustained humanitarian assistance from the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, UNRWA. Those who have attempted to flee across Syria's borders to other countries in the region have generally not been welcomed by host governments. They have faced closed or tightening borders, forcing a significant number of them to enter neighboring countries um, clandestinely. And upon entrance, they generally live under a precarious legal status. An increasing number of them have continued on to Europe. So in this presentation, um, I focus on the effects of the Syrian war on the Palestinians of Syria, including their displacement across Syrian borders. First, I give an overview of the situation of Palestinians inside Syria. Um, then uh, I talk a little bit about those who have left Syria, fled Syria, once again becoming refugees. And while much of the presentation analyzes the response of governmental actors and intergovernmental agencies to the plight of Syria's Palestinian refugees, I end uh, by shedding light on actions taken by Palestinian refugees themselves to address the devastating effects of the Syrian war. So Palestinians in Syria. Similarly to their Syrian counterparts, Palestinians in Syria have been severely affected by the ongoing conflict. Syrian towns and villages, as well as Palestinian refugee camps, have been subject to repeated attacks and prolonged sieges by troops loyal to the Assad regime and by Syrian rebels. And here's a map of Syria with a different Palestinian refugee camp. Um, the, some of the camps that have been the most affected are in the Damascus area, so camps like, uh, and there, if you, it zooms in right here in the, the square here. Uh, so camps like Dera, Sbeine, Khanishie, Yarmouk, Husseinie um, have suffered significant shelling, destruction, and the massive displacement of their population. And then up north, uh, this Camp Ain Natal here um, has also, it basically in 2013, was um, uh, basically rebels basically came in and declared the camp a military zone and expelled the camp's entire population. And today the camp lies in ruins, um, basically because of um, fighting due to repeated efforts by the Syrian government to uh, reclaim it. Um, and then if you look at the camps in the sort of Damascus, greater Damascus area, uh, right now Khanishie uh, is one of the most affected. It's been caught in heavy fighting that has basically sealed it off from its surrounding areas and basically made it um, almost impossible for humanitarian aid to, to get through. And then uh, Dera camp is another one that was uh, completely depopulated. A lot, some of the Palestinians have been able to come back to the area, uh, to the, around the, the city of Dera, uh, but some of those neighborhoods also, like Muzeiri, Benjilin, have been um, affected by, are caught in heavy fighting and again, kind of sealing off the, the population from its surroundings. And then Yarmouk camp, uh, located in, at the southern tip of Damascus, is in the third year of a siege um, that has been particularly prolonged um, and has had a devastating effect on civilians and has caused a significant amount of deaths uh, from starvation, uh, approximately 200 um, as of now. Um, as of January 2016, more than 3,000 Palestinians have been killed. 1,048 are being detained and 282 are missing. The majority of detainees are in Syrian government prisons, but some are also being detained by various uh, rebel factions. UNRWA, the main humanitarian organization that is assisting Palestinian refugees affected by the war in Syria, was created in 1949 in response to the Palestinian refugee crisis stemming from the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, in 1948. Thus, um, it had already been operating in Syria uh, for over six decades when the uprisings and subsequent war started about five years ago. Before the war, it was mostly providing education and basic social services to Syria's, um, uh, Syria's Palestinian refugees. It was also engaged in um, infrastructure and socioeconomic development in some of the camps. And here, you know, also just to kind of give you an idea of what these camps were like before the war. This is Ain Natal, which is now basically in ruins. Um, and also to pick up on uh, some of what Julie was talking about. Um, so within the last decade, um, UNRWA has been um, 
has undergone this shift in policy where it's actually trying to engage with Palestinian refugees through a much more developmental kind of approach and um, uh, trying to introduce urban development within the realm of the of the refugee camps. And actually, um, Ain Natal and another camp, Nadab, also up north, were the focus of uh, this development project that was basically a pilot project for UNRWA's attempt to um, basically bring urban development to the camps. And with regard to the notion of uh, a move away from encampment, I think you're seeing that with UNRWA as well in relation to Palestinian refugees. The idea, part of, part of this effort is actually to, I mean, part of this urbanization effort of the camp is also to sort of um, make it so that the camp is much more connected to its surroundings. Uh, and also notions of self-reliance um, are very much present now in, in, uh, in UNRWA discourse. So um, the UNHCR is definitely, those policies are also having an effect in, in, in UNRWA, on UNRWA, and, and which is also applying it to, or was applying it to Palestinians in Syria. Um, out of this uh, pilot project has now emerged um, uh, uh, a program, uh, basically infrastructure and camp improvement program um, that is again basically about uh, approaching Palestinian refugee camps through an urban development approach and uh, it, it has been used in other camps in Jordan, uh, in the West Bank, in Lebanon, for example. Uh, and I think the reason uh, Syria kind of served at the pilot about 10 years ago for this approach was that it was such a stable uh, place. So these are, there was housing infrastructure, um, uh, roads were paved, the Aleppo bus system was uh, brought all the way into the camp. That wasn't the case before. A water tower was built to, um, and the whole, uh, to extend water distribution to the entire, entirety of the camp. Another camp, uh, Nadab, also in the Aleppo area, um, initially was made up of these World War II, these barracks, army barracks left uh, over from World War II, and you can still see some of them, the zinc-covered barracks. Um, it's become a very sort of cramped um, living space. And so as part of this development project, also there was a housing uh, aspect to it, but also um, here you have a, a youth uh, skills training project against this, this notion of self-reliance. Um, okay, so today UNRWA has reverted back to a focus on emergency aid consisting of services such as food assistance, cash assistance, health services, non-food assistance such as blankets and mattresses. Uh, it's also uh, providing uh, emergency shelter for about 9,000 internally displaced Palestinians. Um, and at the same time, in parts of Syria that are uh, sort of relatively stable, and usually it's parts that are firmly under regime control, it's actually continued some of its pre-war developmental assistance. So um, it's maintained its microfinance and loan programs in some parts um, of the country that are sort of relatively stable. And it's also continuing to um, provide education to about 43,000 Palestinians in Syria, as well as Palestinians who've been displaced from Syria and jo to Jordan and, and Lebanon. Um, and then finally, it's also involved in some degree of advocacy with regard to the legal protection of Palestinians affected by the war. Um, UNRWA now has an official protection mandate. It's not, it, there's not much it can do except plead with states, and so, you know, it's not particularly effective, but it, it, it is um, involved in, in that as well. So now, I um, just want to go over uh, the situation of Palestinians who fled Syria. Uh, most of them are in Lebanon. There are about 42,000 in Lebanon, uh, Jordan, about 17,000, 4,000 in Egypt, and um, uh, significant numbers in Turkey and increasingly Europe. It's kind of hard to come by exact numbers for Turkey and Europe because for a lot of those uh, heading to Turkey, Turkey is a transit point for going to Europe. So uh, with regard to UNRWA statistics, what they're saying now is that at least 50,000 Palestinians have fled to Turkey and Europe. Um, on the other hand, the um, Action Group for Palestinians in Syria uh, claims that uh, there are about eight six to 8,000 Palestinians in Turkey, and about 71,000, according to them, have, ha, are now in Europe. So now, just a brief country-by-country -country overview. Um, 
early on in the war, uh, in January 2013, the Jordanian government announced a non-entry policy for Palestinian refugees. So very early on, they basically closed their borders to Palestinians. Uh, and so since that policy has been adopted, Pal Palestinians who've tried to get to Jordan have had to do so uh, through basically relying on smugglers. Uh, once they're in the country, they're um, under threat of deportation, and Jordan has carried out some deportations. Um, they're also not allowed to to uh, integrate camps that have that, that have been set aside for Syrians, except for Cyber City, which is more of a of a detention center with very little uh, mobility. Um, with regard to Lebanon, uh, initially it was relatively easy for Palestinians to uh, cross into Lebanon, and then Lebanon has been progressively tightening its borders towards Syrians as well. But by May 2014, basically, um, Lebanon effectively closed its borders to, to Palestinians. And around that same time, it also placed restrictions on uh, the ability of Palestinians already on its, from Syria or on its territory to renew their residency paper. And so um, I think last I checked, I think maybe about 80-something percent of, of Palestinians from Syria now in Lebanon have expired residency documents. And so again, basically living under threat of um, arrest or possible deportation. And then that hasn't really happened in Moss, but you're, you're basically living, um, you know, it's, it's a very precarious, uh, insecure uh, living situation. Uh, there's also another problem related to that is that uh, there's a whole generation of Palestinians, Palestinian babies, Palestinians who were born in Lebanon who are not being declared, not being registered because parents are afraid because they're not in a regular situation. Um, okay, so... Um, Contrary to Jordan and Lebanon, uh, Egypt is not part of UNRWA's area of operation. And so because UNRWA doesn't officially operate in Egypt, normally Palestinians who fled to Egypt should come under the mandate of UNHCR. However, the Egyptian government has basically um, opposed that um, and so has basically forbidden UNHCR to assist uh, Palestinian refugees. I'm not sure they've officially explained why. Uh, UNRWA employees I've talked to seem to think it has to do with this whole, this kind of links back to the 48 war and this notion that if Palestinians are integrated within UNHCR, then it leaves Israel off the hook. Um, so anyway, so basically there is no official organization assisting Palestinians in Egypt. Um, UNRWA, however, has been, uh, they, this, they've opened uh, sort of a liaison office in Egypt and they've been um, kind of advocating. And so I think through their efforts, uh, there are some UN agencies on the ground, like the, um, I think the World Food Program and others who are assisting Syrians. And they've been able to sort of figure out a way for those agencies to also um, help Palestinians in Egypt a, a little bit. So the Turkish government, um, you know, sort of reportedly, and again, I think Maurizio's talk kind of showed this, you sort of have a progressive tightening of borders, but for a long time, Turkey was sort of characterized as having this sort of open door uh, policy and, you know, uh, not engaging in um, uh, for example, um, and also allowing uh, unlimited duration of stay. Um, that's been the case for a while, more or less, but increasingly you have reports of uh, refugees, both Syrian and Palestinians, being shot at at the border, uh, being pushed back. And now, very recently, you have also reports about uh, deportations, uh, deportation of, of, um, of refugees trying to cross the border. And again, um, with um, Turkey, UNRWA, Turkey's not part of UNRWA's area of operation. So again, Palestinians and Turkey should fall under the mandate of UNHCR, but um, UNHCR doesn't have a presence in Turkey. It, it does provide aid, but the aid is distributed through the Turkish government. And it, it appears that that aid is not reaching Palestinians. Part of it has to do, I think, with the fact that contrary to Syrians, Palestinians need a visa to, to go to Turkey. So uh, those who have crossed into Turkey have done so again through smugglers. And so they're there in an irregular situation and they've just been, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's purposeful or not, but kind of invisible to, to Turkish authorities. And uh, 
Palestinians that I interviewed in southern Turkey in the towns of Gaziantep and Kilis um, basically claimed that they weren't receiving any kind of assistance from um, the Turkish government or any kind of sort of international um, organization. They also claim that they're not allowed to integrate camps that have been set out set up for Syrians. Apparently, some have been able to, but it's because in the beginning, the Turkish government assumed that it was all Syrians. And then once they realized that there were Palestinians, they've um, apparently uh, stopped uh, or prevented Palestinians from integrating the camps. Um, let's see. So given the harsh realities uh, affecting Palestinian uh, refugees in Syria and neighboring countries, an increasing number of them are continuing on to Europe. And this is just uh, a map of uh, sort of uh, kind of the latest route, I guess, um, to, to Europe and specifically to, to Germany um, that is taken by many of the refugees from Syria. Um, so since similarly to their Syrian counterparts, it is impossible for Palestinians to get visas to Europe uh, from one of the Middle Eastern host countries, their only option is to go clandestinely. Uh, and these journeys are filled with uncertainty and danger. Accounts of these journeys highlight the danger of being abandoned by uh, smugglers before reaching one's destination, of being cheated out of one's money by smugglers without making it to Europe being shot at, arrested, or detained by authorities at the point of departure. A lot of reports, uh, Egypt, for example, there's a lot of reports of Egypt uh, engaging in that kind of behavior. Um, being arrested and detained along the way, countries like Greece, uh, Hungary, Malta, for example. Um, and as has been very publicized in the media, drowning during the, the crossing of the Mediterranean. Female migrants face additional dangers. A report by Amnesty International released um, this January notes that female refugees from Syria and Iraq face violence, assault, exploitation, and sexual harassment at every stage of their journey, including on European soil, from smugglers, security staff, and other refugees. Since September 2015, the clandestine voyage uh, to Europe from the Middle East has become a little less dangerous and costly, even if it remains risky and a uh, risky and harrowing uh, experience. Uh, when photos of three-year-old Aylan Kurdi lying face, face down on a Turkish beach after an unsuccessful attempt to cross over into Greece with his family were circulated on the international media, an outpouring of sympathy within Europe towards refugees followed. Um, Germany soon announced an open door policy toward refugees from Syria and others fleeing war and violence. And so this basically meant that once the, the refugees really had to uh, rely on smugglers from Syria um, all the way to Greece. But once they reached Greece, usually authorities would just kind of move them forward um, towards uh, Germany. And so the prices also have kind of decreased. When I was doing interviews in spring 2015, um, usually the journey, if you're going to go through Turkey, then by boat, and then mostly by foot, and maybe some transportation, people are talking about five to seven thousand dollars. And I think now, uh, if, if you're leaving from northern Syria, um, the numbers I've heard are closer to two thousand um, dollars. Now, that sympathy uh, now seems to be evaporating and anti-refugee and anti-migrant sentiment peaked in the wake of the November 13 Paris attacks in which one of the um, ISIS attackers was believed to have reached uh, France by posing as a refugee and also increasing media reports, uh, uh, sort of media reports filled with um, news about migrants being involved in active petty crime or in the sexual harassment of European women. So having largely failed to persuade Turkey to stem the flow of migrants um, to Europe, um, basically in exchange for financial assistance, most European countries are apparently coalescing around a European Union proposal that would effectively turn Greece into a giant processing center for migrants. As part of this proposal, the EU is discussing the option of expelling uh, Greece from the EU's passport free travel zone and allowing EU member states to suspend the Schengen Agreement, basically the sort of borderless free movement within the EU, for up to two years. And actually Germany, Hungary, Sweden, and Austria have already taken steps in that direction by recently reinstating temporary border controls. Another plan, which is uh, endorsed by Jean-Pierre Juncker, the president of the European Commission, is to send an EU police force to the border 
between Greece and Macedonia. I think uh, Maurizio talked about that, to create a buffer zone uh, between Greece and the rest of Europe. Um, and the reason Macedonia is being considered is because it's not part of the EU. Also, as part of these recent discussions, uh, apparently Belgium's minister to the EU proposed building a refugee camp able to hold uh, about 300,000 uh, in, in Greece. So this is sort of a brief overview of the situation, very brief um, uh, overview of the situation in um, Syria and also outside. Um, when examining the response to the human tragedy unfolding in Syria with respect to the country's Palestinian population, the media, as well as academic scrutiny, have largely focused on the actions of official actors, such as Syrian government, Arab host states, European countries to which uh, Palestinians from Syria fled, major humanitarian organizations such as UNRWA, as well as powerful uh, unofficial groups such as the rebels. In the rest of this presentation, I would like to focus on the response of Palestinian refugees from Syria uh, to their own predicament. The examples I detail here are based on approximately 40 interviews I conducted in spring and summer 2015 with Palestinians from Syria who were living in Lebanon, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, France, Sweden, and the United States. The overwhelming majority of them having um, fled to those places as a result of the war. My interviews are filled with examples that range from acts of care and compassion located in more or less intimate realms to more organized forms of public activism. A theme that appeared often in the interviews was parents trying to protect their adult sons from being drafted into the Syrian army um, through the country's compulsory military service, which applies to Syrians and Palestinians, or from being arbitrarily arrested at regime or rebel checkpoints because basically they're men of fighting age. I heard about parents confining their adult or sometimes teenage sons to the house for months um, at a time out of fear of them getting arrested or targeted by various uh, warring factions at checkpoints. And then this would eventually become untenable. And so parents would um, stay behind, pull resources to enable their adult son to flee Syria. In one case, an eldest son was accompanied, accompanied by his mother and younger brother, still a child, on his way from Damascus to Beirut as a protective mechanism, since he would draw less attention and suspicion by traveling as part of a family um, than if he were traveling alone. Um, there were several examples of Palestinians in the Gulf countries supporting family members in Syria or those who had fled to neighboring countries such as Jordan and Lebanon where um, there's little opportunity to make a living. Some of the Palestinians I interviewed in the UAE mentioned supporting family members who were still in Syria, including the widows and children of uh, male family members who had uh, died or disappeared. Palestinians I interviewed in Europe who had crossed the Mediterranean told me about singing cheerful songs on the dingy, dingy boats or inflatable rafts during the crossing, partly as a psychological device to calm their own nerves, but especially so that the children would not feel afraid, um, so that they would think, they were simply going on a fun outing. Female interviewees who made the crossing alone told me about being sexually harassed by smugglers, but also about how fellow male migrants, in this particular case, uh, fellow Syrian and Palestinian travelers, um, looked out for them and attempted to protect them. In the rest of this presentation, I exit the realm of the intimate to that of public and organized social and political activism. I focus on Palestinian responses to the siege, destruction, and depopulation of Yarmouk. So before the war, and I, you know, I, I'm not sure this is something that um, sort of at least people outside of the Middle East realize, but before the war, Yarmouk was exceptional in the way that it combined socioeconomic integration into Damascus, as well as its status as a commercial center with an enduring identity as a refugee camp known for its uh, political activism around the Palestinian cause. It also counted many grassroots social organizations. Um, before it was, and here's another picture of uh, this is Shere Yarmouk, the, sort of the main street going through the camp. Um, before it was infiltrated by rebels in December 2012, Yarmouk had turned into a refuge for Syrians fleeing neighboring areas that had become engulfed in the fighting. Yarmouk's inhabitants welcomed displaced Syrians, housing them in schools and mosques, and providing them with food, blankets, and other kinds of assistance. Uh, one interview explained the zeal with which Yarmouk's Palestinian residents welcomed internally displaced Syrians as a way of paying Syrians back for their hospitality towards Palestinians. However, Yarmouk's fate took a turn for the worst on December 16, 2012, 
This day is remembered by interviewees as Tarabat al-Mig, the day when the Syrian army bombed the camp using uh, Soviet MiG fighter jets. Uh, the, bomb, the bombs hit several schools, a hospital, and the camp's uh, Abdel Qadr al-Husseini Mosque, which you see in the background here, and killed at least 25 civilians. Mass flat out of Yarmouk began um, after these bombings, which also served as an, as an excuse for Syrian rebels uh, to infiltrate the camp, drawing Yarmouk into the war. In July 2013, Yarmouk was sealed off from Damascus by a government-imposed siege. By that time, only 20,000. By that time, only 20,000 of the camp's pre-war population of 150,000 remained. Yarmouk was no longer a safe haven for Syrian refugees and local, effort toward, uh, local efforts turned toward the camp's remaining inhabitants. Several pre-war social organizations, uh, and many of them tied either directly or indirectly to various Palestinian political factions, sprung into action, distributing food, collecting waste, and providing clean water to residents. Some of them include the Palestine Foundation, affiliated with Hamas, the Islamic Jihad Social Branch, and organizations such as Jafra, which was a, a youth center in the camp before the war. And after the war, the, those, those were, Jafra members were displaced. Uh, some of them ended up in Lebanon, and now Jafra has become this NGO um, that is involved in uh, humanitarian assistance uh, to Palestinians in Syria and also until recently uh, to, to, to Yarmouk. Um, and part of its membership is still, or was still, uh, at least until recently, uh, trapped in the camp. Um, also, you had individual residents um, getting involved, documenting abuses committed by uh, different sides of the war. Uh, docu um, also volunteering the camp's functioning hospitals or in its alternative schools. So I'd like to end this presentation by taking a closer look at these schools, which have received some amount of um, publicity in the Arab press, but no publicity in the, in the, in the Western press. So Al Jazeera, for example, has an article on them. In December 2012, UNRWA suspended its services, including its primary education program in Yarmouk after the camp descended into violence. With the tightening of the siege in July 2013, formal secondary education provided by the government also came to an end. Several alternative schools were set up by camp residents, uh, and at least some of them are still operating. I interviewed Abu Samah, the founder of one of these schools, in the Turkish town of Gaziantep in April 2015. He had fled to Gaziantep for, for, from Yarmouk about 10 months earlier. Abu Samah is an uh, Arabic language teacher by training who worked in a government high school and at the Damascus University before the war. After Yarmouk became embroiled in the war in December 2012, he decided, along with his wife and nephew, who are also teachers, to hold classes at home for their own children and a few others, primarily to make sure they wouldn't lose um, their basic reading, writing, and arithmetic skills. As the students who joined the classes grew, they started looking for a bigger space. They began holding classes in the basement of buildings in the camp, uh, basically to shelter themselves from uh, shelling. They got desks and chairs from abandoned UNRWA schools. People in the camp who witnessed their efforts started offering to help. They donated pencils and notebooks. Former residents who had fled the camp also heard about these efforts and wanted to contribute. Abu Samah and his partners received calls from uh, bookstore owners in the camp who gave them permission to break into their stores and take the school supplies that they needed. Pretty soon, the goal shifted from maintaining basic skills to providing full-fledged schooling. Three schools were established, serving grades one through nine and hosting 5,000 students. The classes were taught by volunteers from the camp. With most of the educated residents in the camp having fled, the majority of these volunteers only had high school diploma, but Abu Samah gave them additional training. The school started getting media attention, especially for operating despite the regular fighting and shelling affecting the camp, resulting in civilian casualties. In Madrasa al Zahra, the school run by Abu Samah, seven students died either in the school or on their way to school as a result of shelling. The attention the alternative schools were getting in the media prompted UNRWA officials to reach out, all the while explaining that they could not uh, officially offer help because officially their services were suspended in Yarmouk. We told them we do not want financial support. All we want is that you recognize these schools and recognize the students and their results, Abu Samah explains, explained. This demand was fulfilled. UNRWA recognized the alternative schools as legitimate, meaning UNRWA would recognize their programs, degrees, and report cards. Later on, UNRWA would play a crucial role 
uh, along with the Palestinian Authority, in negotiating with Syrian authorities to allow students from Yarmouk, uh, Yarmouk's alternative schools, who had who had to take national exams in Damascus in order to graduate to be able to exit the, the camp during the exam period. In October 2013, the beginning of what Abu Samah describes as the period of hunger, Fitrat al the camp lost its first hunger martyr, a baby girl named Wajd. This period was a time when those who had the most food were eating one meal a day. Others were eating one meal every two or three days. Students started showing up to class tired and dizzy. Some of them were suffering from anemia and from diseases such as hepatitis and jaundice. Abu Samah and others running the schools were considering closing them, but parents intervened, begging them not to, because at least when the children were at school, it took their mind off the hunger. So the school stayed open, but the curriculum was adjusted so that only half of the school day was spent on core subjects, and the other half was spent on artistic and childhood development activities. In January 2014, UNRWA was able to make its first food delivery since the siege had started, and was able to continue with intermittent food distributions. By then, Abu Sama was facing growing harassment from Jabhat al-Nusra because uh, his school mixed boys and girls and also because he was teaching subjects like dancing and music. Um, and so eventually uh, he was f sort of facing death, death threats and this is why eventually he fled the camp. Uh, he basically exited with his students who were on their way to Damascus to take an exam and instead of returning to the camp, he fled um, to Turkey. Um, now, in, in uh, I'm almost done. In um, April 2015, uh, the camp was invi invaded by ISIS. And uh, since then, it's really hard to know what's happened exactly uh, to the camp or what's happening inside. Um, but uh, Abu Samah's uh, Madrasa al Zahra apparently seems to still be functioning, even though he's not there. Um, the latest post from the, from the school's uh, Facebook page uh, dates from January 2016. This is an earlier picture of Abu Sama with uh, some of the teachers and some of his students um, when he was still in Yarmouk. So I think I've kind of gone over my time, but basically uh, what I want to point out is that um, in, in this time, as we watch what's unfolding in Syria, um, you know, in addition to looking at what official actors are doing, I think it's really important to also realize um, the sort of the the, the resourcefulness, uh, resilience, and courage of those who are in Syria, the civilians in Syria, and their efforts in trying to um, alleviate the, the suffering that's been caused by the war. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sofian, and thanks to all of the conference organizers, to Adrian and others for arranging the conference. I am very sorry that I'm not able to attend in person, uh, but I do look forward to seeing all of the uh, talks later on after they've been recorded and, and put out. So, all right. Without further ado, the title of my talk is Palestinian refugees from Syria, the Kafala system, and new formations of Jordanian state power. The Kafala system, or the sponsors sponsorship system, charges one individual or group of individuals, such as entities of familial, private, or public types, um, the kafil, or the sponsor, with the legal and economic responsibility of another individual or group of individuals, such as a family. Discussions of the historical development of the Kafala system are often rife with Orientalist language. The system is described in much of the literature as, quote, a time-honored tradition of the Bedouin principle of hospitality and a, quote, noble principle whose ethical goodwill exists in ages long past. The Gulf Arabs, in particular, are said to represent the finest in hospitality, with a generous uh, generosity in welcoming in and feeding, or sponsoring, the stranger and his animals who come your way. But in the 1950s, the kafala system was reinvented in the Gulf as a means to bring a plentiful, but temporary and easily dispensable workforce to the sparsely populated Gulf states without worries about long-term immigration and new claims on citizenship rights. Furthermore, such arrangements were touted as a means to, quote, preserve Gulf culture and keep workers separated from the populace. As a result, in the literature, these historical references to the kafala system are often presented in contrast to the modern usages 
grade abuses by the contemporary kafala system as it is practiced, which is well reputed for the ways it creates and perpetuates structural and uh, structural dependence due to the stark power differential. Furthermore, discussions of the contemporary kafala system are most frequently invoked as a means to describe human rights abuses against migrant labor or for human trafficking of women and children. In Jordan, prior to 2010, the kafala system was only used for migrant workers recruited by nationals, such as household labor. It was not part of the employment arrangements in the qualified industrial zones, of which Jordan has six. This is in contrast to many Gulf countries in which the kafala system governs life for all migrant workers. There are several reasons the kafala system has been used so prominently by modern regimes. First, it helps to ensure the temporality of the resident workers as they are not eligible for permanent residency status or citizenship. Second, the system is compelling for Jordan and other Middle Eastern countries because it carries a measure of guarantee or assurance about the health of the worker due to often mandated health screenings and the shifting of the system to the Ministry of the Interior from the Ministry of, the La uh, Ministry of Labor. So this is the case in Lebanon, for example. Finally, the entire endeavor is highly valued as a means to privatize the migrant experience within a larger state security regime. The removal of state-directed barriers to the movements of people for employment and labor in the private sector epitomizes neoliberal governance. These all have important lessons for understanding the employment and usage of the kafala system for refugees from Syria during the last few years. The Syrian crisis took root in late December 2010 early January 2011 in the southern part of Syria called Dara. Uh, apologies, by the way, if any of this is redundant or um, information you've already covered today. Uh, since I wasn't able to attend, I'm kind of guessing at some of the details that might or might not have been covered. Um, residents of that area, who were a mix of Syrians and Palestinians, were immediately caught in the middle of clashes between the Syrian army and the opposition. As the violence intensified, residents gathered their belongings and headed towards the southern border of Syria into Jordan, where they were previously able to cross as regular visitors into the country with no problems. In the north of Rumtha, a Jordanian city in the north closest to the Syrian border, a man from the uh, uh, Bashabsha family sorry, cleared his compound, which consisted of five apartment buildings, and became the first kafil, allowing the refugees to settle there by mutual agreement with the Jordanian Ministry of the Interior. This center, this complex of apartment buildings, is now considered the first refugee camp to host the first influx coming in from Syria, particularly through the kafala system. In 2011, the Jordanian government began experimenting more widely with the use of the kafala system. According to an interview I conducted with UNRWA in 2013, 55 Palestinian families were settled in Jordan using the kafala system. By mid uh, 2012, 1,300 Palestinian refugees from Syria were accepted into Jordan using the system. As the Syrian war intensified in 2012, Jordan worked rapidly to construct the second largest refugee camp in the world, Zatari, as well as other spaces in an effort at encamping refugees from Syria and to accommodate the influx of new refugees. However, the refugee camps were designed for Syrians, not Palestinians. And mid-2012, sometime in July or August, the government declared that Palestinians from Syria could no longer cross the border at all, unless presumably pre-existing kafala arrangements had been made with the Jordanian family. As a result, the Hashemites forced many Palestinians to return to Syria and refused any new Palestinian refugees or anyone who lacked papers showing demonstrably their status as Syrians. Those without documents were suspected to be Palestinians. As for the few Palestinians who were permitted entry into Jordan, the government closed off the possibility for the kafala system by the beginning of 2013 and prohibited them from staying with Jordanian relatives or any other kafil. At that time, the Jordanian government also asked all families who had been hosting Palestinians under the kafala system to present their guests for relocation to Cyber City. Cyber City is a former QIZ complex in northern Jordan that now serves as a camp especially for Palestinians coming from Syria, which I'll describe in some detail a bit later. Neither the UNHCR nor UNRWA was able to supply the exact number of Palestinians who have fled from Syria into Jordan. They only told me that they estimate more than 20,000 had entered as of March 2014, most of whom entered illegally and after the discontinuation of the kafala system.
By contrast, the Syrian nationals residing in Zadri were able to be bailed out of the camp, actually any of the camps in Jordan, uh, they were able to be bailed out and live as urban refugees by a Jordanian kafil sometime until late 2015. Further, 85% of Syrian refugees in Jordan live in urban areas outside of the camps and have done so primarily with the help of the kafala system. The process is now essentially over, however, for both Syrians and Palestinians. So the argument that I'm making in this um, paper and presentation, which is still very much in development, and so I look forward to your comments, um, is that while at first glance the Kafala system signals the privatization of refugee management in Jordan, the discontinuation of the system has enacted more violence on refugees, particularly Palestinian refugees from Syria, PMRS, and reestablished the Jordanian state as the arbiter of refugee acceptance and mobility, public health, racial and ethnic, as well as religious purity and class privilege. And one idea I've started toying with is the prospect that maybe this is a kind of post-neoliberal form of governance, um, the retracting of privatization options or private sector options for people. Um, so briefly, again, if you've gone over any of this, my apologies. Uh, I just wanted to indicate that Jordan has taken officially um, over 600,000 refugees from Syria. Um, most estimates by the UN, various UN agencies, as well as the Jordanian government, actually place the number of refugees at 1 million. Jordan recently did a census, and uh, during the census, the number of people living in the country was believed to be 9.5 million. 6.5 million are there in Jordan um, as residents legally. And the remainder, three and a half million, are refugees who are there as registered refugees, temporary um, visitors of some kind, or people who have not um, been able to establish permanent residency. Um, I just want to take a moment to point out that um, there were a large number of uh, Palestinians living in Syria prior to the commencement of the civil war, approximately um, half a million of them. The largest camp was Yarmouk, uh, from which we've seen the devastating photos and testimonies of people living under siege, uh, where they've consumed for over a year now approximately 500 calories per person per day in food aid. Um, the demographic that I spoke with primarily, although not exclusively, are Palestinians that come from Dada, from the Dada refugee camp, which is number eight in the far south. According to UNRWA, more than uh, half a million Palestinians have been displaced or become refugees from Syria, nearly 100,000 of whom have sought refuge in neighboring Jordan and Lebanon combined. As of April 2014, one UNRWA re report indicated that over 13,000 refugees from, sorry, Palestinian refugees from Syria had sought their support in Jordan. The vast majority of these refugees live in communities through informal host families, so not through the Kefala system, or in rental properties that they're renting of their own um, accord and volition, which is considered illegal by the Jordanian government. There's also one rumor, a pretty powerful rumor I've heard, um, that approximately five to 12,000 Palestinian refugees from Syria have moved to the southernmost city in Jordan called Aqaba um, to live off the grid and for fear of being caught by the Jordanian government and sent back to Syria or sent to Cyber City. Palestinian refugees from Syria present a difficult case as they encounter compounded political vulnerabilities that ethnic Syrians do not. Most prominently of them, the Palestinian refugee um, movement out of Syria renders them legally both stateless and statusless. Many of the Palestinians in Syria had previously been residents in Jordan. Prior to the conflict in Syria, Palestinians in Syria, in Syria had relatively wide freedom of movement back into Jordan, many of whom uh, left Jordan during the 1970s for Syria. And as a result, at that time, they lost their legal status as Palestinian refugees in Jordan, but retained an option of returning to the kingdom to live or visit family, and the passage was relatively easy. After the Syrian uprising began in 2011, Many of these Palestinians wanted to exercise the option to return to Jordan and also requested their Jordanian documents back from the 1970s in order to resettle in Jordan. The Jordanian government refused to issue the papers, instead holding the Palestinians at the border for days, and in some cases even months, especially after mid-2012. 
To deflect international condemnation, Jordan permitted Palestinian children under the age of six to enter for emergency medical treatment, knowing that many families would not accept separation, where anyone over the age of six would be uh, detained or kept in Syria, um, or that they would prefer to have their child return to Syria after the child was well. Um, this is a map of the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. The largest is Zatari, which is in the center of the map, sort of towards the top, near the city of Mafraq. If you look just to the west um, and slightly to the north, you see Cyber City. It's very close to the border, uh, very close to the Dara region, and the closest uh, Jordanian urban area is Ramtha. So Cyber City is part of a complex of qualified industrial zone, QIZ, uh, buildings that were rented out by the Jordanian government to host the growing number of Palestinian refugees. The residential building, which is on the bottom left, consists of six stories. Uh, it's also the, the figure on the, the right, just from a different angle. Um, two units and two communal kitchens per floor, and 12 rooms in each unit. Uh, the building has the capacity to hold around 480 people, with approximately two people per unit. It looks strikingly similar to the dormitories um, at any of our campus universities. Surrounding the building, um, are, these are some images on the top left, um, are about 14 single room mobile units that house non-NGOs, um, such as UNHCR, Save the Children, um, as well as uh, machinery, these are the images of machinery that is no longer working, defunct, um, and otherwise unsafe for usage in any way. In addition, um, near the NGOs, there's a small area that contains a mosque, two supermarkets, a playground, a women's room, and an activity center. The entire camp is under the management of the Jordanian Ministry of Interior, although aid is provided through UNRWA. As of June 2014, the number of refugees in Cyber City had reached 394 people, or around 90 families. And they consist of either completely Palestinian members or Syrians who are mixed with Palestinian families. Only approximately 50% of the people in Cyber City, however, are Palestinians. Residents of Cyber City come from Yarmouk and the Dara refugee camps and the Dara region, as well as points elsewhere. Life in Cyber City is deemed to be difficult and is often referred to as an open air prison, as rules and regulations for those in the camp are becoming stricter and more constrained. Palestinians and their families are not allowed to attain any formal identification card or a Ministry of the Interior card that defines their status as refugees and renders benefits to them. Um, that's because they are governed under UNRWA status other than um, UNHCR status. And so this is what it means when I say that the Palestinians are not only stateless, but statusless. They don't have formal recognition by the Jordanian government in any way. Denied also employment and income, Palestinian refugees in Cyber City are bored and listless. The younger generation is driven to depression, uh, according to many of the refugee women. It's become very hard to maintain a family there, let alone start one. The UNHCR uh, vouchers that are provided through UNRWA are insufficient, um, and there's no access to higher education. Many families have been separated, which I'll talk about in more detail. According to one of the UNRWA workers I spoke with, many Palestinians in Cyber City say they would rather return to Syria than stay in Cyber City, but they're not able to leave. The unbearable situation has led to several youths uh, to attempt suicide or to escape. Actually, during one of my visits, I came um, just the, the week after a 14-year-old had jumped from the top of the building um, in an attempt to uh, kill himself, and uh, he was unsuccessful and had broken both of his legs as, as well as a few other bones. As of June 2014, 45 people had run away, 30 of whom were found and returned to the camp. Many were able to abscond through the empty construction zones um, around the QIZ, and others requested vacation time um, and did not return. Residents of Cyber City are extremely isolated. Uh, governments have responded to the Palestinian refugee families in Cyber City in a variety of ways. The Jordanians have systematically sent troublemaker families, that's how they've been talked about to me, back to Syria. Um, Europeans have offered to take and resettle actually many of these families, 
ultimately decreasing them, the number of cyber city residents by about 25%. One important point to note is that France has refused to take Palestinians of any kind from Jordan, um, indicating that they're not in the business of resettling Palestinians. However, the remaining 13,000 plus Palestinian refugees from Syria in Jordan face an uncertain future defined by such fractured histories. Are they Palestinian refugees eligible for citizenship in Jordan in a way that they might have been and might have had access to in the 1970s? Are they Syrians and able to benefit from the possibilities for either migration to the West or a safe return to Syria or points beyond? By all accounts, the answer to these questions is a resounding no, which prompts only more speculation about what alternatives might exist for their futures. The Catholic system proved to be particularly disruptive to mixed families that included both Palestinians and Syrians. While there's no discrimination of aid between Syrians and Palestinians per se, they are given the same sort of baseline um, monetary assistance and, and in-kind assistance, although the amount of resources uh, is much smaller and fewer in Cyber City than there is in Zatari, for example, or points outside. There is less that can be done for Palestinians by law. Aid distribution and the management of Syrians is conducted by UNHCR and, as I mentioned, of Palestinians by UNRWA. The Jordanian Ministry of the Interior is unable or unwilling to issue ID cards to Palestinian refugees who fall under the purview of UNRWA. As a result, it's difficult for Palestinians, if not impossible, to leave Cyber City because without the ID card from the Ministry of the Interior, getting stopped means that they could be understood as illegally present in Jordan. Over the course of uh, 2014 through 16, I spent some time in Cyber City. Typically, my visits were for four or five hours per day, two to three days per week, over the course of a month or two during my, my intermittent visits. I spent much time with the NGO staff that oversee aid projects in Cyber City, as well as many of the families, especially the women who reside there. The Kefala system, it seems, has been particularly difficult for families of mixed ethnic uh, legal descent. Palestinians married to Syrians and vice versa, the children of male Palestinians, the children of male Jordanians, uh, etc., become particularly important issues as dissent for citizenship and residency is traced from father to child. In interviews with residents of Cyber City, I learned that in 2015 there were 190 Palestinians, in addition to approximately 200 Syrians, residing in Cyber City from the same sets of families. These individuals of the same family were in different legal and residential situations because the Palestinian members had no official documents registering them as legitimate refugees in Jordan. They also, also suffered from an inability to access the public and the world's attention. While a family's mother, a Syrian, would be able to leave the camp with a vacation release or at least a few months prior be bailed out under the Kefala system and live in urban Jordan, Palestinian members of families are completely unable to leave the camp except for extreme cases such as medical care. They're not allowed to travel together to visit family, to go shopping, to conduct any business outside the camp, even though the mother in that kind of example would have full rights to do so. I heard many stories of families who had some members of their family living in Zatari, uh, who are ethnic Syrians, while the Palestinian members of the family were required to stay in Cyber City. Such families had typically successfully petitioned for family reunification, but then all had to live in Cyber City. And given the structure of the dormitory, that meant that they were living over the space of several different rooms and not in one single shared housing unit. Living outside of Cyber City or in Zatari was not possible for the Palestinians particularly following the end of the kafala system for them. Stories of parents separated from children are also rife amongst the Palestinian refugees in Cyber City due to the cancellation of the kafala system. And in the remainder of the stories that I'm telling, um, and in the interest of protecting their identities, I have altered a number of identifiable details, and the pictures of these particular refugees are not included in the pictures that are on the screen. Um Muhammad is a 35-year-old Palestinian woman in Cyber City. She had a Jordanian husband to whom she is not currently married. They're divorced. Her six-year-old son had been living in Syria at least part or most of the time with her, but he had a Jordanian citizenship. As a result, Muhammad, her son, now lives outside Cyber City 
but Umm Hamid is unable to do so. Her son lives with his father's family in urban Jordan, while she waits for some movement on her case for reunification. She is, as a Palestinian, stuck in Cyber City, and she's unable to visit her son outside of the camp uh, and her former husband and his family have enacted very strict positions forbidding the son's travel to visit her in Cyber City. Were the kafala system still in place, Muhammad would be able to visit her son and likely find a kafil to help live closer to him, potentially even house him herself. In a case of the inverse of such ethnic and legal statuses, UNRWA informed me of a case where a Jordanian mother had come from Syria with three sons, ages four, seven, and eight, who are all Palestinian due to her uh, former husband's status. Her husband, the uh, Palestinian, was killed in Dara, and then the Jordanian mother brought the Palestinian children to Jordan, but was told at the border that the children under the age of six would be able to enter Jordan with her, but those older than the age of six, the seven and eight-year-olds, would not be able to enter Jordan at all. UNRWA was trying to advocate on their behalf, but in this case, the kafala system would have enabled the Jordanian mother to sponsor her own children and bring them into Jordan with her. In yet another case reported to me by UNRWA, two Palestinian parents from Syria brought their two wounded children to the Jordanian border. The children were both under the age of six, and the parents were told by Jordanian officials that they would accept and treat the children, but the parents needed to stay on the Syrian side of the border and would not be able to accompany their children to the hospital. In this case, if the hospital were able to serve as a temporary kafil, the parents would have or could have accompanied their children and then looked for a more permanent sponsor for the whole family. Due to these fears of separation, many in and out of Cyber City have taken great lengths to hide their status as Palestinian. At the Syrian border, those with Palestinian documents were sent to Cyber City, as were those without any documents at all. Palestinians from Syria tried to obtain forged and fake documents as Syrians in order to escape the quote-unquote sentencing of Cyber City. One family I met was eventually discovered to have had forged identification documents that listed them as Syrian. They were returned to the Syrian refugee processing point in Jordan, Rabah Sahan, and then deported back to Syria. Another family I met in Cyber City was in a very similar situation and was at risk of being sent back to Syria. For these families, as well as those that are refused entry to Jordan at all, returning to Syria is often considered a death sentence. For new children born in Jordan to Palestinian fathers or parents, the situation is even more tenuous. In one case, uh, I learned of a Palestinian couple who had entered Jordan with fake documents listing them as Syrian refugees. The woman gave birth to a baby, and as a result, the baby was officially and legally registered as Syrian. Simultaneously, this Syrian-Palestinian child becomes uh, both legal and illegal, both Palestinian and Syrian, and legitimately residing in the country as well as a criminal within it. These liminal positionings that the ending of the kafala system prompted are deeply distressing and will carry impacts for generations to come. While the kafala system in the literature is so highly demonized as either a corrupted orientalist mode of sociality or a mode for human trafficking and the disempowerment of migrants in Gulf states and their abuses, the case of Palestinian refugees from Syria demonstrates that the Jordanian government has utilized the kafala system in a way that is new and distinctive, using it for refugee management, but also one way by which many of the moral promises of the other modes continue. The kafala system helps guarantee that the migrant populace is not permanent and that they must, quote, pass muster in terms of their physical and their moral health and contributions. The Jordanian government maintained the kafala system as the primary means of governing the original influx of refugees from Syria. At first glance, it appeared to be a means of privatizing a refugee populace in a country that has experienced and managed waves after waves of refugees. However, the push to encamp refugees from Syria meant the end of the kafala system, and disproportionately so for Palestinians. This rise in state-sponsored securitization and governance of the refugees from Syria meant that the end of the kafala system actually penetrated families more deeply than the use of the system itself. As families found themselves torn at the Syrian border, within Jordan, or even within the encampment system in Jordan, 
They often turn to private, black market, and criminal measures to better ensure the unification and security of the family unit. While the Kefala system is much maligned in many reports, and justifiably so, the impacts of not utilizing the system as a means of exerting new formations of state power also need to be considered. Thank you very much.